Chapter 1776, Angel Feather Clothes Ever since the aircraft was cut down, the road had stayed quiet. No others made an appearance. Brother Kong, you are so powerful. Of course you might be fearless, but we are merely ordinary men. If the feathers try to take us out, then I fear things might turn out poorly. Hansen spoke to Kong Fei as they walked. Kong Fei squinted his eyes and looked at Han Sr. Do you want me to take responsibility for you? It is not about you being irresponsible. We are not girls, after all. Hansen smiled, and then went on to say, We just want you to point out a trail we can follow. Kong Fei laughed and said, I myself, I tread any trail my feet take me upon. I don't follow any in particular. So, if you would like me to point out a specific road for you to embark upon, I fear that will be difficult. There was nothing more Hansen could say, so he just chose to follow after Kong Fei. He simply didn't understand what purpose Kong Fei had in bringing them both along. It would be exceedingly easy for Kong Fei to kill the pair if they displeased him. With such a difference in their power levels, Hansen was curious why Kong Fei wanted them to tag along. Hansen had even wondered if Kong Fei was one of the crystallizers. He very much looked like them. Mosi was 1,000 miles away from Western Grand City. Kong Fei didn't want to take the train there. In the beginning, they had at least been able to ride a supercharged tractor, but now it was all down to the use of their legs. The journey was excruciatingly slow. Kong Fei was not in a rush, either. It was like he had gone out for a casual stroll, keen to relax. Han Sen and Stay Up Late were worried about the feathers that had seemed intent on attacking. The quieter things were, for the time being, the stronger the next assault would be. That was what they reasoned. Even though Kong Fei was not afraid of anything that might occur, they would be. The three of them walked for half a month, and nothing happened. It looked as if the feathers had forgotten about the three of them. Kong Fei was pointing towards the fields and explaining things as if he was a professional tour guide. He recited tales to them, such as the ones featuring the Lady Mountain and General Temple. The way he spoke such fables made them sound tangible and real. Kong Fei was a man who could tell stories, and tell stories well. The legends he spoke about were stunning. Fascinating. Even if Han Sen and Stay Up Late knew the end of a tale he had begun speaking about, they'd still listen eagerly, just to hear him tell it. On the seventeenth day, as they neared a stone bridge that crossed a river, Kong Fei stepped onto the bridge and spoke to them. By crossing this bridge, we will have reached Mosi Mountain. If you are not here to collect ore, then there is no need for you to follow. We can part ways here. Han Sen and Stay Up Late were in shock. They had walked together for 17 days, as if it was a journey they had all embarked upon together. They hadn't walked far, and Hansen swore they had only walked 400 miles. They should have still been far away from Mosi Mountain. But when Hansen and Stay Up Late looked forward to where the mountain should have been, they were shocked. On the other side of the stone bridge was a sign that said Mosi Mountain's old treehead village. They were both surprised by this, as they both acknowledged the fact that they hadn't walked that far. Somehow, they had walked a thousand miles without realizing they had, and they had now arrived. Kong Fei must have done something. It was a scary thing for Han Sen to now notice that he had walked a thousand miles, but hadn't realized he was doing so. Thanks for walking with me for the past seventeen days. It was a fateful encounter, and I would like to give these to you both. Consider it as a reward for accompanying me here. Kong Fei pulled out two feathers from his clothing. He flicked them forward and they landed neatly in Han Sen and Stay Up Late's hands. One for each. Han Sen noticed, after the catch, that the feather was incredibly soft. They were no bigger than his hands. They were proper feathers, that was for sure. They definitely weren't xenogeneic material. Do you know what these feathers are? Kong Fei blinked. Han Sen wished to say he didn't know, as many creatures had feathers. He couldn't tell them apart, but his face suddenly changed. He asked Kong Fei, this cannot be the feather of a feather. Kong Fei laughed and said, The wings of a feather have feathers. There are two feathers between the wings that are softest, and they are called angel feathers. They cherish them dearly. My clothes are crafted from angel feathers. Hansen almost coughed up a bucket of blood. The feather clothing had at least a thousand such feathers. If what he had spoken was true, then how many feathers had he killed to craft the garment? Now that Kong Fei had given them two angel feathers, was he looking to add gasoline to their dead bodies? The feathers had no reason to want to kill Han Sen and stay up late. But now that the pair were holding two angel feathers, the feathers might very well want to. 
Kong Fei knew what Hansen was thinking, and so he said, Don't worry. If the feathers see them, they won't kill you. Brother Kong, we are actually interested in digging ore. Would you like it if we accompany you further? Hansen did not believe the feathers were that nice. Kong Fei looked at Hansen as if he were smiling. You really want to come? It is not a difficult way to go now, but there is an unfriendly guard watching. What guard? Stay up late, asked. Duke Brilliant. Kong Fei looked up towards the mountain, speaking with little sounds of concern. Hansen and Stay Up Late looked at each other. After being chased by feathers, and now having a possible contest with the Duke, it looked like big fights would always be part of the package when it came to following Kong Fei. If they left now, Hansen did not believe the feathers would let them both be. There is nothing to be afraid of, so we will go wherever you go. Hansen thought staying with Kong Fei would be safer. Kong Fei seemed to be smiling slightly, and he said, Come with me. Then, if that is your desire, you can leave whenever you wish to. I will not stop you. After that, they walked across the stone bridge and proceeded onwards to Mosi Mountain. Hansen and Stay Up Late quickly followed. They had come that far so they felt compelled to see what might happen next. Kong Fei didn't look entirely legit. He had brought them to danger more than once, and he provided them with two deadly feathers. If Hansen did not know that Kong Fei could kill them with ease, Hansen would have thought Kong Fei hated them and wanted them dead. After getting close to the mountain, they saw a feather standing before the entrance. It was too far for Hansen to feel the being's energy flow, but the elegant armor and crazy clothing made the fellow look special. I am flattered that Duke Brilliant has personally come to welcome us here. Kong Fei looked at the feather as he spoke, but he didn't actually look flattered. Where did your feather clothes come from? Duke Brilliant stared at Kong Fei's apparel, looking as cold as ice. Chapter 1777 The Burial Site of 3,000 Feathers Long ago, 3,000 prisoners were forced to mine or across Mosi Mountain. They were unable to leave until death claimed them. Kong Fei did not answer Duke Brilliant. All he did was say something that made no sense, given the current context. But after Duke Brilliant heard what he was told, his face paled and he shouted, Who are you? Kong Fei still did not answer. He kept going, saying, Those 3,000 prisoners were slaves, kept here forever. They would each die in the same bindings they were birthed into. After their deaths, the feathers between their wings were plucked. There were 3,000 of them, and they provided the basis of this garment. Impossible. We already killed all the traitors a long time ago. Who are you? Duke Brilliant's eyes cut like blades. He looked as if he was ready to tear Kong Fei apart and slice up all his organs. But Kong Fei just smiled and took off his feather clothing. His upper body was naked, but two strange scars were visible on his back. They looked as if they could have been the slots where wings might have once existed, but they had been ripped off. Duke Brilliant saw the scars on Kong Fei's back, and when he did, his face changed. His eyes flared with the fire of murder, and he yelled, I cannot believe there are traitors that yet remain. It is lucky you were able to live this long. How dare you appear here, having killed? Feathers. You must die. After that, Duke Brilliant waited for no further reply. His body shone with the color gold, as his wings spread out like suns of their own. Their light shone across the area, and everything the light touched was turned into gold. The rivers became solid and the rocks became clumps of pure gold. The entire vicinity became its own world of gold. Duke Brilliant was most certainly the god of this world. Hansen and Stay Up Late were in shock. They knew that everything happening was very bad and such scary powers would be difficult to fend off. And if they themselves were turned into gold, they'd be killed immediately. But before the gold light doused them, the white feathers Kong Fei had given them started glowing with a bright white light. The light was like a bubble that shielded their bodies from harm. The gold light was unable to penetrate the holy light. Kong Fei stood on the ground and put on his feather clothes again. He ignored the gold light, and with much disdain, told their enemy, of the three thousand, only I am left. But the three thousand feathers are still here, and I will seek vengeance for each of them. A traitor speaks of justice? Duke Brilliant grunted. His wings flapped like gold suns, firing shockwaves through the atmosphere. Each time the wings flapped, Duke Brilliant became stronger. His body wasn't so big, but it did seem as if it was becoming larger. He was taking on the appearance of a statue as he stood there upon the mountain. Hansen and Kong Fei were like ants before him. It was quite scary. 
In the homes of the powerful Feather families, there were seven kings and a number of dukes watching the video relay of a satellite imaging system. They were watching what was happening on Mosi Mountain. When they saw the scars on Kong Fei's back, they were all shocked. King Sky King, the ruler, frowned and said, there were 3,000 feathers stuck in the mines of Mosi Mountain for their entire lifetime. They were all turned into dust, or so it was believed. How could one of them have survived? My king, they did become dust. We could not have been incorrect, and the king in those days confirmed this. There were no survivors. Unless, Song King stopped speaking there, and did not continue. Unless what? King Sky King asked coldly. Unless one of them had a baby inside the gold mine without us knowing. That child might not have been counted amongst the 3,000. But if it were in places such as the Eclipse Gold Mine, they could not have lived there. How could the prisoners have bred successfully? And if they did, the baby could not escape the eye of the Watcher. It could not have survived and lived. It just makes no sense. Song King shook his head. This person appearing now is pointless. Just go ahead and kill him and get this done. Holy Column King did not move his eyebrows as he spoke. He just said things lackadaisically. All the other kings agreed and they proceeded to watch the video. Duke Brilliant was like a Buddha as he tried repeatedly to strike Kong Fei with his palm. The golden palms covered the entire sky, like a golden palace was falling. The shadows they cast were abyssal, shrouding the landscape in darkness. Kong Fei's eyes did not move. He just pulled out a white feather and drew across the sky. A small white light rose into the air. It cut the giant hand. A lesion appeared across it and grew bigger until it was revealed that the hand had been sliced in half. Gold blood started to cascade. Arg. The scream was incredibly loud, but the hand did not stop descending. A small white line traced up the hand, down the arm, and across the body that the arm connected to. Duke Brilliant's gold body was cut open, splitting in two. The earth was shaking as the blood rained from the sky with the force of a river. Mountains and rivers were further dyed with the gold blood. Only the white feathers looked new and undrenched, without a speck of blood on them. Hansen and Stay Up Late were surprised. For him to have killed a duke so easily, Kong Fei had to have been a king. The many kings and nobles were in shock. Song King himself looked dim and said, I cannot believe that Hybrid managed to become a king. Leader, please grant me permission to fight the Hybrid. One king stepped forward, looking murderous. Killing a Hybrid like this will require thunder. I will fight alongside you. Holy Column King stood up, asking King Sky King for permission to depart. Before he replied, Kong Fei waved his white feather again. Mosi Mountain, which was a thousand meters high, was sundered in two by the same feather. Below the thousand meter high mountain were thousands of nameless graves. If the mountain had not been broken, no one would ever have known. And yet, so many lives were buried there. Kong Fei walked in front of the nameless graves. And just when Hansen thought he was going to pray for them, Kong Fei grabbed his clothes and shook them. The clothes exploded in the air. The feathers scattered all across the graves. The feathers flew onto the graves and exploded. They revealed the bones that lay hidden beneath. The bones were rotten, and many had been reduced to nothing but dust. Two feathers landed on each grave. Three thousand years of hope sapped waiting. Three thousand years of sadness and injustice. Three thousand years of humiliation. I am going to win it all back. You guys will not need to wait for me any longer. You don't need to stay in this world any longer. Chapter 1778 The Fight to Extinguish the Lie As his solid voice echoed, Kong Fei's body started to unleash power. The water wave did not come from his body, but it was as if the whole world was answering his summons. The earth was quiet, and the stars in the sky were shining. Even though it was daytime, the stars were everywhere. It was as if he was breathing in the galaxy, brimming with power. Kong Fei's back was against the graves. He looked to the sky. Between the stars, there was a temple. It was floating, up in the atmosphere. Amidst the endless numbers of planets and systems, they all saw this temple in the sky. They were all shocked. A Geno Hall has appeared? Who is what it takes to summon it? Who is the challenger? Wondered everyone who saw it. Even the higher races of the galaxy were shocked, seeing this. It had been a thousand years since a Geno Hall last appeared, and there it was, showing up again. It felt like a great danger was descending once more. This was especially true for the races that had not been able to light a fire. No way. All the Feather Kings were in shock, and they stood up in response. They looked at Kong Fei, 
in the ancient temple that now appeared. They had a bad feeling. Kong Fei started flying up towards the ancient temple. As the ancient temple appeared, a voice came along with it. Many strange shadows surrounded the temple, but whenever Hansen looked at the shadows more closely, they vanished. Kong Fei was in front of the door to the place. He pointed his finger at it, and a drop of blood flew forward to it. Every creature was attracted to the sight of his blood, and their eyes watched as it floated forward to touch the gate. Boom. The mysterious, ancient temple was opened by that blood. That meant the gates approved of the genes possessed by the one who wished to enter. Now, he could go forward and attempt to claim his spot. But the blood still hovered right in front of the door. It was unable to enter fully, due to there being no space left inside. All the fires in the temple quivered crazily. They released a power that was a grand threat. A warning. Everyone turned to look at the naked man, hovering in the air. They were waiting for something. Kong Fei's face looked as if he was mocking something. He slowly said, Feather. Boom. The ancient temple's lanterns became dimmer, but only one started to blaze brighter. The scary flames burst out like a volcano, all from a single lantern. It was hanging in the Geno Hall. The lantern also displayed gold lettering, which read, Feather. Those of all the other races felt greatly relieved. They even found it rather funny. Only the Feather Kings and their nobles felt their faces turn green. They moved so fast that space itself crackled as they sought to reach the naked man. Interesting. A feather wants to replace a feather. Interesting. Amidst the pirates, a man looked to the sky. He looked evil. In a dark hall, a few beasts looked at the man near the Geno Hall with the feather lantern. An attractive lady in the middle of them said, I cannot believe there are still interesting people like that around. At the zenith of Unsolid Mountain, a beast that was in the sky looked towards the lantern, quietly saying, one of these days, the roar will be in the Geno Hall. We will be at its highest spot. Hansen, standing in front of Mosi Mountain, could feel the brilliance of that power. He had a lot of thoughts running through his mind. The Feather Kings soon entered the space, and the nobles were like a swarm, surrounding the naked man. They were so loud, they could have roused the entire universe out of a slumber. Kong Fei had no more white feathers, as the original 3,000 feathers had been returned to their owners. The two feathers that belonged to Kong Fei himself were in Han Sen and Stay Up Late's hands. The feather's light had brightened up. All the feathers were heading for the air because of the light. If the heavens ever fell, all the angels would fall to the earth and frighten all the other races. No one had extinguished a light in a thousand years, but a billion years ago, fights like this were common events. This was an average fight between two different races. The competitors would use all they could muster to defeat their opponent to take their place and light up a fire in the Geno Hall. This was ordinary. But Kong Fei was fighting a race all alone. What was most unbelievable about this, though, was that he was a feather without wings. Seven kings, the leader included, had come for him. The sword lights cracked the river of time, breaking it as scary presence was swallowing the galaxy. All this power came from the sky, and Kong Fei did not take a look. He only stared at the lantern, with the word feather on it. Seven Feather Kings, with the other feathers, landed on Kong Fei. But Kong Fei kept dodging as a weird light beamed through his muscles, skin, and hair. All that power came for him, but it didn't even brush his hair. It was all just like wind, rustling around him. Blurk. But the Feather King and the other nobles suddenly started to cough up blood. Many of the feathers were falling, and it was difficult to tell how many of the feathers had been killed. Their faces all looked pale with plumes of feathers descending. God body. He became a god. Holy Column King screamed as he coughed up blood. He wasn't just a god for the feathers. This was for every race. Everyone was shocked, seeing this. Many people screamed just like Holy Column King did. They yelled, God body. Kong Fei, are you really not going to stop this? King Sky King wiped away his blood, looking at the man as he spoke. Death is the only thing that will stop me. Or your death, Perhaps, Kong Fei said coldly. He then raised his right hand and swung it at the lantern. King Sky King angrily shouted, Protect our lantern. Millions of feathers, and King Sky King himself, roared in unison. The entire feather race was racing for the fire. The lantern was shining brightly, with power gathering up. It became a gold angel statue, clutching a great sword. And it was swinging towards Kong Fei's hand. Chapter 1779 One Person one race. 
The angel figure that the gold flame had created gathered up a power that was indestructible. It looked as if it would only take one hit to destroy an entire galaxy. It could destroy the future. Many powerful races were thinking that the feathers were practically almighty. If the race wasn't strong, then the lantern wouldn't unleash a power that was as brilliant as that. It represented the strength of that race. If it was strong, it'd go bright. It was weak, it'd go dim. Creating a sword that could destroy the universe proved how strong the feathers were. Kong Fei faced the lantern, but his own face didn't change. He looked at the word feather on the lantern and reached out with his arm to strike it. His arm was glowing. It was very bright he didn't fall back, despite facing a race composed of a billion beings. His confidence was unwavering. Hansen's blood ran fast when he witnessed all this. He wished he could fight with that man in the air and let the blood flow. But Hansen knew his place, and he knew his power wasn't high enough to fight alongside him. Any noble there would be killed in one hit. Hansen held back his passion, and he watched as Kong Fei stood alone. He intently stared as Kong Fei faced an angel of the race that hounded him. The next second, the angel sword lit up the planets in the sky. Everyone lost their vision, and all that could be seen was the color gold. The gold light lasted a few seconds, and when it faded, everyone could see what remained in the sky again. The gold angel was a kilometer tall, and she stood right in front of the door to the Geno Hall. Her back was still connected with the lantern. Kong Fei flew in front of her, with his right arm covered in blood. It had been severely cut, and you could even see the bone beyond the ravaged flesh. Did we lose? Stay up late's eyes were full of shock, and he said those three words. But in the next second, the angel's body shattered into nothing more than fragments of gold light. They all scattered and fell into the galaxy. The word feather on the lantern cracked and disintegrated as its light was extinguished. Darkness took its place. Blurk. All the feathers around coughed up blood, like a rain shower. Their bodies looked as if they had all been electrified. It looked like they had lost a big chunk of their energy. Countless feathers started to fall. Kings had their ranks reduced to being just dukes, as dukes became marquis, marquis became earls, and so on. This applied to every feather. The youngest of the feathers could not be any lower. Their base was damaged, though, and their talents were reduced. They were injured, and if they wished to evolve again, it would take forever. Kong Fei, just kill me. King Sky King shouted, with blood seeping out of him. Snuffing out the light was worse than killing him, he thought. The lantern of the feathers made them a higher race. They had held that loft for a billion years. Now that they had become a lesser race, this was a thousand times worse than simply killing them outright. Kong Fei smiled and said, Three thousand ghost feathers suffered for three thousand years. Cry for three thousand. Hate for three thousand years. That is a pain that is worse than death. They had hope because they still had me. But you guys are all different. You have no hope. And you will fade without it. After that, Kong Fei's blood landed atop the lantern. A white fire appeared, lighting up the place. Kong Fei. You are a feather, too. We are sorry for what has happened. But you just murdered a bunch of feathers, and even kings. This loss is far graver than the 3,000. This should end. I beg you to place the word feather on the lantern again. You can be my king, and I will adhere to your every command. Holy Column King kept on pausing to spit out blood. He shouted at Kong Fei, but there wasn't an ounce of intimidation left. He was a mere beggar now. If you can write down feather, we will do whatever it is you want. A few feather kings, King Sky King included, begged before Kong Fei. Kong Fei's blood was not pure, but he did have feather blood. Riding down feather would make them a higher race once again. The moment I ripped off my wings was the moment I discarded my belonging to the feathers. Kong Fei sounded normal, but his aura of hatred was scary. One race, my race, will one day be called no. It will start with me, and it will end with me. No other race will be granted the title of belonging to no. Kong Fei's voice was so loud. Even the stars trembled in response to his frightening vow. The Geno Lantern, with its white fire, soon displayed the word no. Blurk. King Sky King continued to cough up blood. Kong Fei's word cut all chance of possibly sharing the lantern. The feathers could not be regarded as a higher race anymore. Rain. A heavy rain. All the planets started to rain, and the lightning danced among them like dragons. It looked like they were crying for a higher race having fallen, but celebrating the birth of a new higher race. Hansen was standing in the rain, looking up at the Geno Hall. 
The moment when the no lantern flew into the temple's hall, Hansen's heart felt strange. It looked to him as if there were eyes on the inside, staring down at him. The Gino Hall was watching the entire world. The black armor that had no movement suddenly brimmed with a phantom strength. It made Hansen feel as if he was frozen. All he could do was stand in the rain. What's going on? Hansen was in shock. When the lantern entered the hall, the Gino Hall's doors shut. When it vanished to wherever it had come from, Hansen felt a weird power enter his sea of soul. It went straight into his black armor. Hansen's body returned to being normal again. His black armor had no movement, and it was as if it was dead. Hansen looked to where the Gino Hall had disappeared, and his face looked confused. When the Gino Hall doors shut, that feeling slowly started to disappear, and the black crystal armor's power only seemed to cover him during the time when it was open. This could not have been a coincidence. What is the black crystal armor? Is it like this because of me? What was that feeling of being watched? Is something living inside the Gino Hall? Hansen now had an endless list of questions, none of which he could currently figure out. The spirit hall left, and weird things no longer occurred on other planets. You could only see an empty sky returning now. The broken feathers, and Kong Fei himself, were gone from sight. Hansen was standing in the rain thinking. Then, a naked man suddenly approached him. It was Kong Fei, who had become a no, all alone. Chapter 1780, One White Feather and Three Thousand Stars Kong Fei stood in front of Mosi Mountain, which had been sundered in two. He was standing in the rain, letting it drench his body. He stood there in solemn silence, without speaking a word. A while later, Kong Fei sighed and said, You guys have wanted to leave for all eternity. Even in death, you still wish to be free. I guess a burial is not what you're interested in. After that, he waved his hand. Inside the mountain, three thousand graves unleashed a bright white light. Like a spring, Bones burst out of the earth, headed for the skies. The bones melted in the air, becoming dust as they surged up through the atmosphere. They went up into space, disappearing amongst the stars. Quick and clean. That will save so much trouble. The only good thing about you guys was the fact you never caused trouble. Kong Fei looked up at the stars and smiled. But then, a glistening tear fell from his face. Hansen and Stay Up Late were standing a few paces away from him, speechless. A while later, Kong Fei smiled and spoke to Han Sr. Do you guys understand yet why I wanted you to accompany me? Han Sen and Stay Up Late shook their heads. They didn't know. After all, why would Kong Fei choose them to come along for something so important? Han Sen had initially thought that Kong Fei wanted to trick them, but he had realized by now that things weren't that simple. Kong Fei walked over to them and patted their shoulders. He said, I was found by a crystallizer, and that is how I escaped the fate of my people. I escaped the mind that none of the others could make it out from. I was helped by a crystallizer, and now, you two appeared as a reminder. It's fate. It had to be. A crystallizer helped you escape? Who was he? Hansen and Stay Up Late were shocked. They couldn't believe that someone who had conquered a lantern would have a connection to the crystallizers. I don't know. He did not tell me, and I never saw him again. I do know that he was carrying a nine-life cap pendant. Kong Fei was looking down at the feathers he had given to Han Sen and stay up late. Take those as souvenirs. For as long as I live, they may prove useful. And those of higher races will definitely notice them. They're a gift, and they're yours now. You are free to do with them as you please. After that, Kong Fei left. He didn't walk away briskly, but he did disappear after a few meager steps. Just as Han Sen was going to call for him to come back, he was gone. Nine life cap pendant? Who might that crystallizer be? Hansen wondered, as a number of thoughts now raced around his mind. This universe is big. It was a good idea to come here. Stay up late suddenly sighed. He had always been quiet and reserved, but now he was brimming with a vibrant passion. Hansen was not as sensitive as he was, though. For all intents and purposes, he was a realist. But even though there were many elites, that wouldn't quell his desire to train and improve. He wanted to see the world and everything in it. Let's go. We need to get out of here. Hansen pulled Stay Up Late back. Kong Fei had left with no warning. He didn't offer them a way back, and to add to that, they were a thousand miles away from Western Grand City. When Kong Fei was there, it was an easy trip. Without him, it most certainly wouldn't be. Hansen called out for Kong Fei so he could lead them back. God only knew what might happen to them if they traveled by themselves. When the pair reached the bridge they had crossed earlier, 
they saw someone standing there. The person was holding an umbrella. But due to the item's presence and the heavy rainfall, they couldn't make out who it was. But that person had a life force as powerful and bountiful as an entire galaxy. It was unfathomably large. Hansen and Stay Up Late stopped to look at him. And when they did, the person turned to look at them. A while later, the person asked, Are you guys willing to sell the white feathers you possess? No, Stay Up Late shook his head. Hansen just smiled. What's your price? The feather is priceless, but a trade always demands a price for negotiations. 3,000 deposits of star or for one feather, the person slowly said. Too low. Hansen shook his head. 300 life planets for one feather, the person said. Hansen shook his head again. The enigmatic figure did not speak to him again. Instead, he turned to talk with Stay Up Late. If you enter my tribe, I can help you reinforce the white feather. After that, you can enjoy the treatment only my kind can provide. Stay Up Late shook his head, to which the person responded, Do you have any idea what you'll be missing out on? Even if you do have a god feather, it's useless if no one refines it for you. I appreciate your intent, but I do not wish to join any tribe, Stay Up Late said. The man grunted, and when Hansen turned to look at him, he had disappeared. It looked as if he had never been there at all. They kept walking and crossed the bridge. Not long after, a beast appeared near the river. It was so big, it looked like a mountain from a distance away. Are you selling that white feather? The beast asked, looking right at Hans Senator. Its voice was so loud, it almost destroyed Hansen's eardrums. It all depends on the price fronted, Hansen smiled. The beast grunted and said, the feather's lost. I will take on all of holy heaven in exchange for that feather. No, Hansen was very tempted, but he had to shake his head. Holy Heaven was a high-ranking Xenogeneic space. Many treasures must reside there. There had to be countless Xenogeneic materials. Even the feathers held that place incredibly dear. Through that, you could see how important it was. Even though the feathers had fallen, they had not been wiped out. Taking down Holy Heaven was still something no ordinary race could accomplish. The beast said he could swap Holy Heaven's existence for the feather, which was a massive prospect but Hansen was worried the beast might not have been serious. Still, if the beast wished to steal the white feather, Hansen and stay up late probably couldn't fight back. The beast looked at Hansen as if he knew that Hansen did not want to accept the trade and instead spoke to stay up late. Those of the beast area are willing to teach you. If you are willing to join us, I can teach you how to refine it. If you can become a king, I can give you 12 god seats. Chapter 1781 Meeting Old Cat Again Stay up late shook his head and bowed before the beast, apologizing. I appreciate the offer, but no thank you. The beast, hearing stay up late reject the offer, stopped talking. He moved his body and flew up into space. He disappeared into the cosmos. Stay up late and Hansen continued their travel, meeting many more powerful creatures as they went. They all wanted to buy the feathers or at least have the pair join their tribes. Each and every single offer was rejected by the duo, however. Hansen felt depressed. All the elites sought to buy the white feather he possessed, but none invited him into their tribe. It seemed all such offers were exclusively reserved for stay up late. As they walked, they met five different race elites. After that, no more interrupted their journey. It was not as if no one else was interested in the white feathers. It was just that those five represented the biggest factions and had drummed up the biggest offerings. There was no point in any other races making an offer as whatever they could muster would not be enough to rival the Big Five. The rain still hadn't stopped. After walking half a day, they found an abandoned house they could seek refuge and shelter in. But as soon as they entered, Hans Sin's eyes opened wide. A beast that was red, that looked like both a fox and a cat, was lying across a crummy table. It was staring right at the two as they entered. Great. It's you, old cat, you asterisk shoal. How dare you show yourself to me again? I'm going to skin you alive. Hansen was immediately enraged, and he threw a punch towards Old Cat's face. As the fist traveled, he yelled, Where's Little Flower? Old Cat teleported to the rafters in the ceiling, smiled, and said, Little Flower is being looked after very well. Do not worry. Don't worry, my asterisk SS. Bring me Little Flower. Hansen jumped up and tried chasing after Old Cat. Old Cat was too quick, though, and he disappeared once again. When he appeared, he leaped atop the table again. Slowly, he went on to say, I took him away for his own benefit. 
It's good for him. You can't even look after yourself. So how do you think you could take care of Little Flower? How can you expect him to grow naturally? That is my family's business. Not yours. Hansen kept on chasing after Old Cat as he spoke. Old Cat's body kept flashing as Hansen's fist kept failing to touch him. Ha uh ha. -huh. I felt sorry to see someone so special and great have their potential buried. Now, he is living well. Perhaps it'll only take another eight years before he becomes a king. There's every chance he could become a god. He could become a deity like Kong Fei did. You are a father. You should support what's best for him. You shouldn't limit his potential and hold him back. Old Cat was obviously trying to convince Han Sr. I will take care of my own son. You better give him back, or I'll skin you alive right here. Hansen angrily said, Little Flower cannot come back just yet, but I can show you this. Old Cat threw an item at Hans Sr. Hansen had a look and noticed it was a communicator. There was a video feed already linked, and on it, he could see Little Flower. Anime, I really can't eat anymore. Can you help me eat this fruit? Hansen put off his idea of killing Old Cat and held the communicator close. He stared at Little Flower intently. That was mainly because he knew his abilities were actually worse than Old Cat's. Killing the cat would be impossible with his current strength. Thus, the continued chase was pointless. The video was obviously a series of snippets, with many sequences that had been trimmed and stuffed together to give Hansen a picture of what day-to-day -day life was like for his son. Little Flower was definitely eating a lot each day, and a beautiful woman and three monsters took their time to train with the boy diligently. Hansen could tell they were teaching Little Flower some skills, and that Little Flower was improving quickly. Each day, his abilities grew. How does that look? If you kept Little Flower close to you, he wouldn't benefit from any of this. He wouldn't get the training and strength he needs. You should be thanking me. Old Cat spoke with a cocky tone. To hell with thanking you. I am warning you, right now. Give me Little Flower. Otherwise, I'm not done with you. Hansen, still looking at the video threw a punch towards Old Cat. Hansen really hated what Old Cat had done, and he could only catch a glimpse of his son through the video. He wanted his son next to him, and nowhere else. Why can't you just be nice? Old Cat looked depressed. Could you stop swinging for a minute? I have come here to discuss serious business. Old Cat kept dodging as he said, Little Flower wants to learn sword skills. He needs a short sword, and that feather can craft one that is perfect for him. F asterisk CKU. Hansen didn't wait until Old Cat finished talking before trying to punch him again. Hansen knew the asterisk souls wouldn't just give him the video out of kindness. All Old Cat wanted was Kong Fei's feather. Stay up late, said Old Cat. If you take me to see Little Flower, I will give you the feather. When he said that, Old Cat and Hansen were both shocked. The five elites had offered so many deals, and yet Stay Up Late hadn't spared a second thought of accepting any. Now, to see Little Flower, he was willing to give up the priceless feather. It was an extremely touching moment. Old Cat shouted, See? This is what you call a real man. And who are you? A father, supposedly. After that, Old Cat walked up to stay up late and smiled. It's not that I do not wish to take you, but ordinary people. When they go there, they cannot survive. I wouldn't have brought Little Flower if I didn't know he was special. So, how about you just give me the feather, and I will pass it along to Little Flower. Unless I get to properly see Little Flower, I won't spare it another thought. Stay up late, said calmly. Old Cat felt depressed. How do I make you guys believe what I'm doing is for the good of? Little Flower? If anyone could go, I'd have taken you both there already. I can't see Little Flower, so nothing changes. Hansen stopped. He stopped chasing Old Cat because he was unable to catch him. Old Cat sighed and said, It's fine if you choose not to give me the feathers. I'll find another way but I'll tell you right now that you are both so weak. Carrying those feathers is like carrying ticking time bombs. If you don't give them to me, I suggest you get rid of them. I don't believe anyone will come and steal them. Hansen lifted his lips. They are afraid of Kong Fei, so of course they haven't tried to steal the feathers yet. But some creatures will be more reckless than the beings you have encountered so far, Old Cat said. He looked up at Stay Up Late and said, I say Beast Area is a great choice. You'd be fine there and you can keep the deified feather. And, you can find a home with that faction. And about you, Old Cat stared at Hansen with a look of remorse. Chapter 1782, Uncertain Future Old Cat went silent for a bit, then went on to say, 
humans are a branch off the crystallizer tree. Because human blood is not pure, and the sanctuaries force them to grow up fast, their genes aren't very stable. The future is very uncertain for them, lacking the stability of pure blood. Old Cat paused and said, The few elders that you met on the road made stay up late offers of tribe membership because they wanted a king. It wouldn't happen overnight, of course. It would take a lot of work. And they would also have to help you refine the deified feather. Even to a big faction like Beast Area, it would be asking a lot of them. So, it's fairly easy to see why they would choose stay up late. They'd favor a guaranteed success, as there is a lot more risk choosing you due to your instability. That sums up why they didn't dare to invest in you. If humans are that bad, then give me back little flower, Hansen said. Old Cat laughed and said, that's different. You are the first generation, and we aren't certain how far your development can go. Little Flower is different because he's a second gen. He's rich with potential and his genes are stable. He was born like this. Some of that might have been because of you, but you are first gen, and if you want his results, you'll have to work for them yourself. Hansen was too lazy to talk much more, so all he did was look coldly at Old Cat. But don't worry. If you do well enough, you can still become rich. Old Cat rolled his eyes and went on to say, but if you want a big faction like Beast Area to spend on you, that's asking the impossible. Big factions like that tend to avoid risks and liabilities. It's not too different from those investors of yours, back in the Alliance. They will sometimes invest with high risks, but they invest little and expect high returns. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. Investing in you is asking too much of them. No one can ask them to make bets and risks on something so uncertain. I heard you the first time. There's no need to repeat yourself. Hansen rolled his eyes. Old Cat laughed and said, So, I do have a suggestion to make. You can go to the Wanjia Treasury with the feather. Wanjia Treasury? Hansen frowned, not sure what that place might be. He had never heard of it before. Old Cat explained, It's like Holy Heaven or the Beast Area Xenogenic Space. The race that claimed that place, however, is called Thousand Treasures. It is a powerful race, and it has a very high rank in the Geno Hall. They love to collect treasures, and they are famous businessmen and collectors. They are very honorable about it all, too. If you take the feather to the Wanjia treasury, you can sell it for whatever you want. There's no chance of losing out there. But I do suggest that you don't sell it for money. Use it to find membership within Wanjia treasury, Old Cat said. And what would I be joining there for? Hansen felt bad. People were begging stay up late to join, and Hansen would have to give up his feather for membership to one. Hansen didn't want to join the ranks of another race, though. Even if he did, he didn't want to get in with them through material trades. Old Cat quickly said, Keep in mind that joining them doesn't mean you become one of their race. It doesn't mean you'll completely give up your deified feather, either. Thousand treasures adore treasure. They have a special rule. If one from another race has an item that they really want, and if the person wishes to, they can go to the Wanjia treasury and become a member. It doesn't mean you become one of the thousand treasures. If you want an example from the Alliance, think of it as a clubhouse. You can have some protection and authority, and you get to keep the feather. There's no need to worry about others potentially taking it away. You'd be safe with them. Thousand treasures is that generous? They protect me and the feather for nothing? Hansen asked Old Cat skeptically. Of course, there's no free lunch. When you store your feather there, you become a member. When you take it out of their storage, you lose membership privileges. The treasure you store there will be watched by the thousand treasures. But don't worry, they are solid and reliable. You can reclaim your stuff whenever. And they wouldn't conduct research on anything of yours without explicit permission, Old Cat said. Seeing Hansen remain silent, he continued and said, The feathers were just beaten by a lower race. Their power has been lessened. A planet like Planet Kate, that was previously enslaved by the feathers, might find itself in a bit of a mess. So, I advise that you leave and attend to what you need to do. There is a way to contact the Beast Area and the Wanjia Treasury. And if you do contact them, they are bound to come and pick you up. Think about it, kid. The Beast Area is good. It is better to join them and level up through them than to do everything by yourself, Old Cat said to stay up late. After that, Old Cat disappeared. Hansen called out to him, but he was already gone. Hansen was very excited to take the video back to the sanctuary, and when he went back, he showed Little Flower to Ji Yin and, and his mother. They felt much safer, 
learning Little Flower was somewhat safe. There was no need for them to worry, but they only felt a little bit better. They wouldn't feel completely safe until Little Flower was back with them. After Hansen returned to the abandoned room, he spoke to stay up late about what they should do next. Although Old Cat often had dubious intentions, in this case, he was right. Planet Kate would descend into chaos, and it was best that they form a game plan. After a while, Stay Up Late told Hansen, I want to go to the Wanjia treasury. Hansen thought that it was a good idea, as it at least comforted him to know that no one would fight for the treasure there. The treasure could only be accessed by the person who put it in. That sounded pretty great. Hansen wasn't planning on going there, though. The offer sounded good, coming from Old Cat's mouth, but perhaps a little bit of chaos would be good for him. He was planning on staying on Planet Kate. Hansen was surprised Stay Up Late had decided not to join up with Beast Area. But Stay Up Late didn't say why he had made the decision he had, and Hansen wasn't going to ask. Next, they used the number Old Cat gave them to call the Wanjia Treasury. After the call, someone flew an aircraft over to pick up Stay Up Late. Because Hansen and Stay Up Late each possessed a deified feather, everyone knew. Thousand Treasures knew, too. All they did was look at the feather on the return to the Wanjia treasury. Before leaving, Stay Up Late told Hansen he would resume his search for Little Flower. If he learned anything new, he'd give Hansen a shout. Hansen was touched that Stay Up Late was that nice to Little Flower. But it was something that Stay Up Late considered to be his duty. He thought he had failed before, and that finding Little Flower now should be his ultimate goal. Chapter 1783, Picking Up the Treasure After Stay Up Late was gone, Hansen went back to Grand City by his lonesome. He walked for half a day, and then he saw many ships soaring through the atmosphere. He also heard many explosions. Planet Kate really is in a mess. I hope Chiao, Lance, and Mr. Tiger are okay, Hansen thought to himself. Hansen quickened his pace until he reached a smaller city. He wanted to find a public transport service to take him back quickly. But unfortunately, that city was also in chaos. There had been a fight at the train station resulting in its destruction. And aside from that, there were no other means of public transport active. So, Hansen sought to leave town. He was stopped by a group of creatures before he could, though. Friend, let us walk together. The leader smiled at Hans Sr. Why would I follow you lot? Hansen looked at them, and noticed that looked almost like the centaurs of ancient myth. Their upper bodies were human, but their lower bodies were those of bulls instead of horses. Do not misunderstand our intent. We are not hostile, and we merely wish to establish friendships. If you would like, you can visit our place for a while. We don't want to hurt you while we attack Planet Kate. The leading centaur laughed. Thanks, but I can take care of myself, so don't worry about me. Hansen walked around them with the obvious intent of leaving. They may have said that they wanted to keep him safe, but who knew how their intent might turn later on? Hansen did not think Kong Fei's name would make him invulnerable. The centaurs had to be after the feather, he wagered. Please come with us, and do not make things difficult. The leading centaur waved a command, and a dozen centaurs swooped forward to halt Han Sen's departure. Two centaurs were directly in front of Han's senator they tried to grab him. So we're playing hardball, huh? Hansen thought. So, Hansen moved his legs like the wind and evaded them both. He shot away through the residential district, leaving billows of dust behind him. Don't let him escape. The leading centaur shouted as the rest of the centaurs gave chase. Hansen was not afraid of a stampede, and he was able to use his dongshin movements to effectively bob and weave through the streets. The centaurs kept on chasing for quite a while, but they eventually lost sight of him. Hansen emerged from a ruined building. He put on his dongshin armor. The armor made his presence seem much different than it did in his simple spell armor. He was planning to escape the city from its other end. But before he could, he saw an old airship docking there. Many Kate and others were queuing there. Brother, are you a noble of the Kate? When Hansen walked past the ship, a Kate approached and asked him politely. Kind of. What is it? Hansen said. You know the feathers are no longer protecting the planet, right? It has led to planet Kate descending into chaos. We are being invaded. We are from Seven Mirrors, and we are looking to recruit members. We are in dire search of brothers like you. If you join us, you will receive great treatment. You will not have to suffer in the midst of war, the Kate said, as if his offer was something sublime. After a while, Hansen understood what was going on. Seven Mirrors was a higher race, like the Feathers. 
There weren't many of them, though, and they already had a planet to manage. So, they were happy to welcome outsiders to join them. After the feathers fell, Seven Mirrors sent members to begin recruiting from the planet owned by Holy Heaven. Hearing of the conditions and the treatment he would receive, and the way they seemed to do things, Hansen was tempted to join. The reason Hansen was tempted, though, was because after recruiting here, they'd venture to another city to try their luck. Grand City would be on their list of destinations. Hansen thought having a free ride wouldn't be too bad. It'd be better than walking there. At least, I'll have a look and check it out. I won't guarantee I'll join, though, Hansen said to the recruiter. Sure, you should take a look first, but I assure you, you won't regret this. The Kate sounded very passionate about all this. He led Hansen on board the airship, going on to say, but there is a test you must undergo. It's a rule of ours. And don't worry about it too much, as the results don't mean much. The Kate brought Hans into the ship. He didn't have to take the test with the other Kate, and he was taken to a special lobby for it. In the lobby, there were a few other Kates, and others of a different race he had no chance of identifying. They looked like barons. Laudrama. Not bad. You found a baron in this dump. A Kate baron lifted his lips. A few other barons turned to look at Hans Senator they couldn't discern much about him, due to him being clad in armor. The Kate that brought Hans in there, Laudrama, laughed and responded, Good people can find themselves blessed by God anywhere. Everyone looked at him in disdain when he said that, but no one actually said anything else. Laojuma brought Hans into an empty room. There was a Gino tree on the table. Laojuma pointed at it and said, It's just a progress test. It doesn't matter what the results are, you'll still earn the treatment we promised. If your results are excellent, we will offer you even more, though. We wouldn't want to bury the geniuses. Hansen did not say anything and he simply pricked his finger and allowed a drop of blood to fall onto the three. He did not know how much power he had. Ordinary barons were around a hundred. When Hansen's blood dropped onto the tree, it started to grow. The white bone flowers started to bloom. When Lao Juma saw the bone flowers, his eyes almost dropped out of their sockets. How can there be so many? Lao Juma was frozen for a while. He was counting them like mad. Hansen looked over there too, quickly totaling the flowers. There were 434 flowers on the tree. It was a scary number, since normal barons had only around 100. It was more than quadruple. This count nobles could only reach a thousand, and some of them only had around 700. Hansen's fitness was half that of a viscount. Laudrama could not believe what he was seeing, and he kept on trying to count. He was standing beside a monster. It was astonishing to think a baron could have such high fitness. We have found a treasure. Laudrama, thinking this, started to tremble and shake. Chapter 1784, Killing Say, brother friend, are you from a higher race? Lao Zhuoma was going to call Hansen brother, but it wasn't appropriate. So, he called him friend. Lao Zhuoma thought Hansen was from a higher race, because normal barons should never reach that sort of level. It didn't matter how much they practiced, they just couldn't. On the form, didn't I tell you I was human? Hansen acted like he didn't understand what he was being asked. Yes, you did. Lao Zhuoma felt disheartened, as he had never heard of a human before. And he knew there was no higher race called that. Lao Zhuoma still felt depressed, and without saying much, he told Hansen, Dollar, you will have to wait a few days on this airship. But going to Seven Mirrors won't take long, once we depart. That's okay. I greatly enjoy traveling, Hansen said. Lao Zhuoma gave Hansen a room to live in. But without anything to do, Hansen found himself going up on deck. Many refugees wished to board the airship and go to Seven Mirrors. Going to an underdeveloped planet was better than remaining in a war zone, or so they felt. But Seven Mirrors wasn't willing to take just anybody. The nobles were always favored, which made it difficult for commoners to be accepted. Seven Mirrors was not a charity, and they were only going to take those who could prove themselves useful. The old, sick, or injured weren't allowed on board. What race do you belong to? You don't look like you're from Planet Kate, a Baron Kate asked. He had come forward to check Hansen out. Human, Hansen answered. I have never heard of them, so I can only assume they're even smaller than the Kate. The Baron wasn't insulting Hansen. He was mocking himself, more than anything. Hansen looked at him and asked, What can I do for you? I am Mike. The Baron introduced himself, and then said, so, we've been recruited by Seven Mirrors, 
and we're headed to an underdeveloped planet for work? If you want, why don't we go to the same place and partner up? I still haven't decided if I want to go yet. Hansen did not reply. Mike shook his head. When the fighting starts, it's not only the common folk that will be in grave danger. The barons will be, too. Land reclamation is hard, but it is still better than war. So, why the hesitation? We'll see. Hansen didn't much care for what he was being told. Hansen had spoken to Chiao, and he was able to confirm that war had not yet reached Grand City. Xiao and Lan Se were thinking of ways they could escape and where they could go, but they had so far been unable to reach a decision. Hansen told them about Seven Mirrors recruiting, and they told him they might consider it. They'd talk about it in greater depth once they were all together again. The Third Master had evacuated from Planet Kate with Mr. Tiger, and they extended an invite for Hansen to join them at another headquarters of the Black Gold Group. It was an offer Hansen quickly rejected, though. Mike wished to say something more to Hans sound, but something occurred down below. They both looked down and saw a legion of centaurs in front of the airship. They surrounded the people who were waiting for a chance to conduct the test in the hopes of boarding the airship. Lao Zhuma quickly went down to meet the centaurs, though. He smiled and said, Taurus, please do not misunderstand. We are from Seven Mirrors, and we are friends, not enemies. After that, Lao Zhuma pointed at the Seven Mirrors emblem on the ship. The leading centaur recognized it. In fact, it was the reason that the centaurs had taken action. The centaur, seeing the seven mirrors symbol, looked at Lao Zhuma and coldly said, We don't care about seven mirrors. Kill all these Kate. The centaur warriors lifted their spears to kill the Kate that had been lining up. Lao Zhuma looked horrified at the wrath of the centaurs. He had joined seven mirrors, yes, but he was Kate. It hurt to see his own people get slaughtered. Can you show mercy? Seven Mirrors will be accepting these, Kate. We were going to take them to help develop an empty planet. Please? Lao Zhuma gritted his teeth. Although many people would fail the test, Lao Zhuma was a Kate himself. He couldn't just watch them die. Mike looked just as angry, too. He said, The low lives of Taurus happily licked the boots of the feathers when they were in control, but now that they have fallen, these scumbags have aligned themselves with the enemies of the feathers. This is F asterisk King Horrible. Which race did they sign up with? Hansen asked curiously. I think they are called demons. They looked similar to the Kate, but they have horns on their heads, Mike said. Hansen wished to say something, but the leader of the centaurs shouted, What a load of crap. Only the people currently on board the ship count as seven mirrors. Just kill the rest of them. After that, he commanded his warriors to attack the people. Stop. Lao Zhuma shouted. The leader centaur Koli laughed and said, What? Would you like to fight us, as a representative of Seven Mirrors? No. We are merely recruiting. Please be nice and let us take these people. Seven Mirrors has bought their services, Lao Zhuma said politely. Seven Mirrors was not weak, but they weren't the sorts to engage in conflict. This time, when they came to Planet Kate, the supervisor had informed them not to come into contact with any demons. Okay. Let's make this simple. From now on, if they are on the airship, they are yours. If they cannot get on board, then I am sorry. After the centaur leader said that, he gestured with his hands for his soldiers to rush forward. Lao Zhuma didn't fight, he just shouted at the people, saying, Get on the ship. Hurry. Animal. Mike shouted down from atop the ship. Why are they killing them? Don't they need people to develop Planet Kate, too? Hansen asked with a frown. Mike coldly said, Taurus is a race that takes pleasure in killing. They have a grudge with the Kate due to the Kate beating them once before. Now they've got a clear chance. They aren't so willing to let us leave. There was some crying heard from the crowds, as people tried to rush forward and get aboard the barge. The entryway was narrow, though, and if many more people boarded, it would overload the airship. The centaur warriors thundered into the crowds, butchering merrily. The Kate were all just commoners, and so they had no chance of killing the centaur warriors. They were not trained for anything of the sort. In moments, a dozen of the Kate had been killed. Lao Zhuma called for everyone to hurry, but there was not enough room for everyone to get on. Chapter 1785 Killing Centaurs The leader of the centaurs looked murderous. He was gleefully watching his men commit happily to the slaughter, as the droves of people began screaming and crying. This wasn't war. This was a massacre. Ordinary Kate had Geno armor, but they could not fight, they could not resist the onslaught. 
a centaur warrior struck a woman down with a spear. She grabbed it with one hand while pushing her daughter away with a blood-curdling scream. Run to the ship. The centaur warrior tried to pull his spear back out of the woman's body, but her grip was firm. She held tightly to the spear that was deep in her blood-dyed chest. A little four-year-old girl came running over to her mother in tears. She hadn't run to the ship as she had been instructed to. Even if she had listened, though, she'd have been unable to penetrate the crowd. Another of the centaur warriors smiled cruelly. He swung his spear down towards the crying little girl. No. The woman's voice broke. Ping. A horn arrow appeared, punching through the centaur warrior's head, then pinning the beast to the asphalt. Hansen held his gold feather bow as he leaped off the ship. He ran in front of the fallen warrior and pulled the arrow out of its head. Hansen had seen a lot of life and death, and his mind didn't care. But sometimes, his body didn't listen. The other centaur warrior screamed. He pulled his spear out of the woman and tried cutting Hansen down. But all Hansen had to do was move slightly and step past the warrior. He moved his bow and brought its string up to the beast's neck. Then, the severed head fell off and bounced across the ground. De asterisk him in you. The centaur leader shouted furiously. His muscles flared up as he suddenly chucked his giant spear. It crossed a few dozen meters, coming right at Hans Sr. Hansen didn't even seem to look at the spear as he stepped around it. He pulled his gold feather bow and fired two horn arrows. Each arrow neatly punctured the head of a centaur. The closest warriors ran towards Hansen, but he was able to swing around with his bow and use the string to decapitate several of the beasts. The heads barreled through the sky with bloody trails. One step, one kill. He pulled his horn arrows from the corpses and immediately fired them at another two centaurs. How dare you kill my Taurus warriors? I'm going to skin you alive. The centaur leader roared and jumped towards Hans Sr. As this occurred, a few other warriors blew on horns to gather more reinforcements. It was really loud, echoing through the sky. Hans Sound had been quickly killing the enemy. He had one bow and two arrows, but that didn't stop him from being a complete killing machine. Everywhere he went, the warriors lost their heads. That dollar is a nice person, but he sure is reckless. The Taurus HQ is fairly near. He must have a death wish. The barons on the ship came on deck and talked as they watched the action below. Mike's face kept changing. He wanted to go down and save the crowd, but he knew his own limits and realized that he likely couldn't help. It would be easy to get off the ship, but nigh impossible to get back on. If he killed one of the Taurus warriors, those of Seven Mirrors would not let them back. With the situation unfolding the way it was, choosing to engage the Taurus really was akin to having a death wish. As Hansen was killing like mad, Laudrilma looked at him with a conflicted expression. He felt both touched and ashamed. He was a Kate, but he had been unable to protect his own people. With Hansen there, the warriors did not run to the crowd. They all tried to kill Hans Sr. As Hansen fought, he kept moving further and further from the ship. He knew it was pointless to kill the warriors, but he just wanted to buy some time for the Kate to get on the ship. The centaur leader was finally in front of Hans Senator the Beast swung his spear, and it was most certainly stronger than what the other warriors could do. The leader was a baron, but Hans Sen's face did not change. For some reason, his movements allowed him to dodge the attack. When he walked past the leader, the string took off the leader's head just like it had with the other warriors. The barons and Lao Juma on the ship all sighed. The Taurus were very good at killing, and their barons were much greater than Kate Barons. Watching Hans and cut off the leader's head was quite scary. This guy is so strong. He said that he's a human? What is that race? Is it a higher race? A baron asked in shock. It is a shame. If he was allowed to live, he might have been able to do a whole lot more. But he is too reckless. Another baron shook his head. As this occurred, a flurry of footsteps was rushing Hans Sen's way. A centaur warrior was coming, but it was twice as big as the average centaur. It was also clad in metal armor. The four legs could cross a dozen meters in one step. It was different from the spear-wielding warriors, and it was holding a two-meter-long greatsword. Despite that, it carried the sword lightly, like it wasn't heavy at all. But seeing the texture of the blade, it was obvious that the sword was made from heavy steel. There was no way it was actually light. Oh no. This is a Taurus greatsword-wielding Viscount. It is a really high rank amongst the Viscounts. He is so strong and he can wield the element of fire to incinerate foes, explained a baron on deck. 
I hope he can hold out a bit longer. Since he is going to die anyway, holding out another few minutes will allow a few more Kate to get on. Another of the Baron's side. Hansen saw the great sword Centaur coming, but he still remained oh so calm. It wasn't as if he hadn't killed a Viscount before. He had already killed three of them, after all. He kept moving forward, trying to lure the warriors away from the ship. When the great sword wielding Centaur got close, Hansen sped up a little more. The creature was only a hundred meters away. Die. The greatsword wielding Centaur's feet were like thunder. It jumped a few dozen meters with the greatsword swinging towards Hansen's head. The steel suddenly blazed with red fire, radiating enough power to sunder a building. Chapter 1786, Angry Steel Army In a town in the north, the Taurus Viscount, whose name was Angry Steel, was looking at the image in front of him. He was watching the Seven Mirrors airship. Next to Angry Steel, there was a man. He had purple eyes and hair, horns, and white clothes. He too was watching the video stream. If Hansen had seen that white clothed man, he'd have been very shocked. And that was because the man looked like a Shura from the Alliance. Angry Steel looked glum. He was standing next to a master of the demon bloodline, and Angry Steel had been wanting to show off the Angry Steel Army's power. He wanted to impress the demon and perhaps be considered for placement as one of the higher races. But before he could show the man anything, this unfortunate event had transpired. Killing the Kate people was not the mistake. The biggest mistake was for so many warriors, Baron Leader included, to be ruthlessly murdered by another Baron. It all happened so swiftly, it was embarrassing. Mr. Viscount, Taurus warriors do seem to be a little special, as you have been keen to express. Many of them surrounded a Baron, and all of them were haplessly murdered. They don't look strong, I'll tell you that much. Next to the Demon Master, there was a woman with two horns. But her horns were golden, and they were different from the master's horns. Angry Steel Viscount lowered his head to the master and said, I am sorry, Mr. G. It was me merely being useless. Mr. G shook his head and said, That person is a baron, but he is good. This isn't entirely your fault. Order your ten captains to go there and keep him busy. Angry Steel Viscount quickly said, My best captain, Great Sword Viscount, is already there. He can kill the person with ease. Mr. G looked at the video but did not speak. The lady demon sneered and said, Why are you talking so much crap? Are you really that stupid? We need ten of your captains to go, not just the single one. Angry Steel Viscount felt a little enraged by her chastisement, but he refrained from showing it he nodded and said, Yes, I will order all ten captains to go at once. Angry Steel Viscount thought Great Sword Viscount was enough to deal with the Mystic Baron, but he still gave the order to send everyone out there. Greatsword Viscount was already there, and he was running at Hans Senator Angry Steel Viscount thought to himself, if Mr. G says I have to do this, then I have to do this. I definitely don't want to upset him. But Greatsword Viscount can definitely kill that person. He doesn't need anyone else. It'll just be for show. Angry Steel Viscount watched the video feed confidently as Great Sword Viscount rushed straight at Han Senator. Its powerful body had considerable momentum, and it was very shocking to witness. It was like the very planet was shaking. And in regards to his performance, Angry Steel Viscount was satisfied. Great Sword Viscount was not the strongest leader amongst Angry Steel Army, but he was most certainly the most intimidating one. Otherwise, Angry Steel wouldn't have selected him to become the top ranked captain. Greatsword Viscount jumped a distance of a few dozen meters. A large flame enwreathed the greatsword he wielded. His strength and speed were perfect, and the sight of it was beautiful. This is it. Kill that Baron. Let Mr. G know that Angry Steel Army is strong, Angry Steel Viscount thought to himself. Mr. G was looking at Greatsword Viscount when he suddenly smiled. Lao Juma looked pale. He was worried for Han Sin and the Kate that had not yet boarded the ship. The door was too narrow. There was a limit to how many people could get on board, all at the same time. Only half of the group had successfully made it inside the ship. The other half were still out in the open. There were mostly old people, women, and children outside now. Only a few young men were valiant enough to help them get in. If Hansen was killed, the army would return to finish them all off, and the deaths would be many. Lao Juma looked on strangely. Why Hansen was fighting Great Sword Viscount was a mystery to him, and if he had decided to just evade the foe, he'd surely survive longer. He could have even run off. 
But Han Sen was heading towards Great Sword Viscount directly, with no thought of escaping. When the onlookers saw the great sword swinging down, they knew the blow would be something not even a steel airship could withstand. Hansen did not move. His left hand held onto the gold feather bow as his right hand clutched the horn arrows. He pulled the string back as far as it could go, and he took aim at great sword viscount. The bow was a weapon that exceeded expectations at range, but great sword viscount was within melee distance of Hans Senator. The burning steel great sword was going to come against the bow and Hansen had yet to fire. Die. Greatsword Viscount roared as the muscles in his body tightened. He unleashed a scary power that looked like it would crush Hansen and the ship. As this occurred, Hansen unleashed the arrow. The whoosh of its travel sounded as the arrow rushed forward like a toxic cobra strike. It seemed too late to fire now, though. Greatsword Viscount's greatsword was going to come into contact with the horn arrow, then probably carry on through to hit Hans Sr. Greatsword Viscount wore a horrible smile, and he kept roaring. He gripped the sword tightly as he pushed more of his rage into the weapon. He was three inches away from the arrow. But the horn arrow disappeared right before Greatsword Viscount nothing collided with the steel greatsword. Hansen turned and went right past him like a butterfly. He ended up at the foe's side. Greatsword Viscount wished to strike again, but it was then that the creature noticed the vanishing arrow had reappeared. Before he could react... The horn arrow raced through his mouth as he was shouting. The arrow was spinning incredibly quickly. It came up through his throat, bulldozing its way into his brain. It came out again, spraying brain matter and juice all about. Hansen kept on going past Great Sword Viscount, not even concerned enough to look at the beast. He reclaimed the arrow and moved forward. Great Sword Viscount's team was still in the area. Great Sword Viscount's body fell backward, creating a dozen meter long trail. The corpse twitched his brain juice leaked and poured out everywhere. He was going to die. Hansen had no reaction, like this was an everyday activity for him. But Lao Juma and Mike were in shock, and even angry steel Viscount was floored. None of them could believe their eyes. For a Viscount Taurus to go out like that was crazy, especially when its enemy was simply a baron. The team of Taurus warriors had been fighting in a bloodthirsty rage, but after watching Great Sword Viscount be murdered, they were in massive shock. They no longer looked intimidating. In fact, they looked rather scared. Chapter 1787 One Sword to Fight Alone All teams need to reach the battlefield in five minutes. No, three minutes. Angry Steel Viscount shouted down the communicator. His face had turned green. He didn't think Great Sword Viscount would be killed quite so easily. That Baron was pretty scary, and Angry Steel felt so angry, knowing his men were proving to be so useless against the attacker. Usually, this would be fine, but now Mr. G was watching as the angry steel army got massacred by a mere baron and watching as that same baron destroyed a strike team. It made angry steel want to dig a hole to hide in. Mr. G watched the video feed of Hansen for a little while longer, then he turned around and left. Mr. G, please give me another chance. Angry steel army will kill that baron, angry steel said hastily. Keep him busy. Mr. G walked out of the camp. He was looking in the direction of the battlefield. The maid followed behind Mr. G, and as she walked, she said, Sir, he is just a baron. You don't need to challenge the man yourself. If you want to see him alive, just tell Angry Steel Viscount to go and grab him. Mr. G laughed and did not say anything. He kept his eyes to the battlefield as he walked. After he was gone, Angry Steel was incredibly furious. He was shouting into the communicator, saying, I give you five minutes. Kill that Baron before Mr. G gets there. Otherwise, you will all suffer military punishment. After shouting, Angry Steel exited the camp and chased after Mr. G. Angry Steel Army's nine captains did not dare to move slowly. They all led their teams to the battlefield. Taurus were supposedly good at fighting and killing. Their vitality was above average, and their fighting skills were really good. They were in a rush to get there now, but the formation of the teams was not a mess. With nine captains, they were all going to strike at once. Hansen had already killed one strike team, and it didn't even seem to have slowed him down. Because there were too many of the centaurs, all racing to kill the innocents so quickly, he couldn't chase them away. He had no choice but to kill them. Amidst the killing, however, Hansen discovered something interesting. His Dongxian armor could absorb power. Hansen already knew that it gave him energy to fight nonstop but now he was feeling something more in the energy flowing out of the armor. 
If the armor usually had one water tap providing energy, then he could now feel many more open faucets. Han Sen's life was stronger, and his power had increased. This increase happened after he dealt with the strike team. Does this mean the Dongshan armor absorbs the power of the earth? Just like my coin Geno Core could when I used collecting taxes. The more creatures there are around me, the more power I receive? Hansen thought to himself. Hansen soon received an answer to this. When the nine teams arrived, Hansen felt his Dongshan armor give a vastly greater surge of energy. This went beyond merely recovering the energy that he had lost. So it's true. Hansen was quite happy about this discovery, but he didn't know if it was a result of his Dongshan Sutra or his Dollar Geno Core. This was not something Hansen could ponder now, however. He had no time to deny Taurus Viscounts headed his way. They all looked pretty past. Hansen was merely a baron, and even with the Dongshan armor's buff, he still wouldn't be quite as strong as a Viscount. If he missed a single strike, things would turn out very poorly for him. Lao Zhuoma had watched Hansen kill Great Sword Viscount. He had been stunned when that happened, but now there was a whole army of centaurs coming. Hansen was like a small rowboat amidst a sea of tumultuous waves. It didn't seem like things would end well for him. Get on the ship, quick. Lao Zhuoma shouted distractedly at the Kate still trying to board the ship Mike had seen Hansen fighting from the upper deck, and he watched with a complicated expression. Buzz. Before the centaur army reached Hansen, they all lifted their spears and threw them at him like javelins. There were so many of them, they looked like a cloud in the sky. Hansen looked up at the spears that were falling like rain. As he did, the gold feather bow disappeared. His right hand touched his waist, and when he did, something white appeared. A white sword light blazed out from his hand. Under the black rain of spears, it looked like a sun that was swelling to life. Hansen ran into the ring of spears he had cut down, and wherever he went, countless spears were broken. None of the spears could cut through his net of sword strikes. Amazing sword skills. Everyone who witnessed it was flabbergasted, whether they were friend or foe. But the Taurus were not going to retreat, and the nine captains were still leading their teams towards Han Senator. They surrounded him by keeping their formations tightly knit. The sword air travels 30,000 miles, and one sword can puncture nine layers of the sky. I thought that any man who can do such marvelous things must be a sore master. But he is just a baron. I was certain that he possessed a higher rank. Talk about shocking. From a broken building not far away, Mr. G was watching the sword light performance with admiration. Very good. I have followed you and have borne witness to many higher races, but none have used such excellent sword techniques as this baron here. Even the maid gave Hansen a compliment. Angry Steel continued to look terrible. All ten of his teams had arrived, and all they had to do was kill one baron. But they were being destroyed. The sword air cut through his army like a sickle through field grass. What made him angriest, though, was that the man didn't have as much power as any of the captains. And yet, despite that, the Baron was invincible. Angry Steel's soldiers had been unable to do anything to him. It was fortunate the person was only a Baron, so he couldn't use more sword lights. He could only kill one warrior at a time. If this hadn't been the case, thousands would have died in mere moments. Chapter 1788 Killing a Xenogeneic Amidst a Thousand Soldiers Roar one of the Viscounts amidst the nine captains roared. His armor cracked, and his muscles inflated. His skin looked like steel, and his eyes became red. He was turning xenogeneic. Hansen was not surprised by this, though. In fact, he was quite happy about it. Hansen used his Dongshin movements to avoid fighting all nine of them at the same time. But that did not mean he couldn't kill them. It just enabled him to scope out the right time to strike. In the Xenogeneic universe, killing Xenogeneics was widely approved. It was the only way he could nab beast souls, too. The Greatsword Viscount was just a noble when he was killed. Because of this, the Sanctuaries did not get involved and he wasn't able to receive any decent loot. The Xenogeneic Great Axe Viscount went mad. He shouted, right as his steel-like body took off running towards Han Senator, his hands clutched a Great Axe. Han Sen's body moved like some sort of weird bird. When he dodged the great axe, his own sword struck the Xenogeneic Viscount's neck. The pirate bone sword was very sharp, and not even a Viscount's body could withstand its edge. If the pirate bone sword found its target on the enemy, the Xenogeneic Viscount would be beheaded. But the Xenogeneic great axe Viscount was blisteringly fast. 
When the great axe was only halfway through its swing, its operator was able to pull it back swiftly. Then it came at Hansen again, but at a speed that was even faster than his own sword. In the air, Hansen's body had no protection. He was exposed. He borrowed the strength of the air, though, and moved three feet to the side to dodge the raging axe. The other Viscounts pulled out their spears and threw them. They came at Hansen from every single angle. And even though Hansen was moving like a bird, it was difficult to dodge. He was not a real bird, after all. The Dongxian armor's energy kept on surging. He wasn't a bird, but his body seemed light as a feather. He was like a phoenix soaring through the sky. He evaded the spears as the pirate bone sword was swung towards the Xenogeneic's neck again. The Xenogeneic Viscount used his great axe to block. It had been forged from Xenogeneic Viscount materials, too. But even so, it was broken in a single hit. Luckily for the Taurus, the Xenogeneic Viscount was very fast. He roared and fell back a few meters to avoid the deadly strike. A few other Viscounts approached, with all the other weapons being cogs and a machine that was coming for Han Sr. Hansen moved with incredible precision. Despite being locked in an impossibly small space, he was able to break through the effort to surround him. He was still coming for the Xenogeneic Viscount. Everyone could see that this was what he wished to do, however. Amidst the effort of surrounding him, he wanted to kill the Xenogeneic Taurus Viscount above all. He is so brave. He is so strong. He is so awesome. Mr. G complimented Hansen three times. Even Lao Zhuma and Mike knew what Hansen wanted to do, and it was a strangely obvious move to make. Am I crazy, or is he crazy? Does he really want to push and kill the Xenogeneic Viscount while he is still surrounded? Is this guy really a baron? Mike was very surprised. If he isn't a baron, it makes sense why the Taurus are being killed so simply. A baron gave a wry smile. Before Hansen got off the ship, no one could suspect things might turn out this way. No one believed a baron could truly go up against an army as accomplished as this one. And this was something not even a baron from the higher classes could achieve. In fact, amidst the highest lanterns in the Geno Hall, there were barons. But none of those would be as dexterous as Han Sr. Hansen wouldn't say he was the strongest, but if he fought solo, he was the absolute best. The combination of the Dong Xin or his buff, the Dong Xin movements, and his phoenix techniques was something none of Han Sin's opponents would be able to overcome. Assuming no one extra strong appeared, Han Sin would be undefeated for sure. The scary thing was, he had infinite power. He wouldn't be fatigued. Stop him. Angry Steel shouted. He had never experienced such a dire state of affairs before. A baron was challenging the whole of his army, and the baron was going to kill another of his best captains. If the attempt was successful, it would be mortifying. Aside from the Xenogeneic Viscount, the eight other captains knew that if Hansen captured the Xenogeneic's corpse, the angry steel army might still be considered a joke even if they killed him. They all tried to stop Han Sr. But as they moved to attack, they saw that the situation had changed. They were no longer surrounding Han Senator, it was more like Hansen was chasing their leader. After all the fighting that had transpired, they could not stop the sword lights. They knew it was only a matter of time before Hansen put an end to the Xenogeneic Viscount, but when Hansen moved, he was never where they expected him to be. Their swords could not hit Hansen, and many of the swords were broken by Hansen's pirate bone sword. They watched as Hansen quickly approached the Xenogeneic Viscount, but no one could stop him. Roar! The Xenogeneic Viscount shouted. The muscles across his body were huge. In one hand he held a broken handle, and in the other he held the broken head of the axe. He was now running towards Han Sr. There were two Viscounts on the right and left, and there were two Viscounts behind Han Sr. But Hansen looked so calm, and all he did was move quickly. He jumped up, and with a sword light, he spied an opportunity. He came out from the ring surrounding him, twisted his body, and slipped past the Xenogeneic Viscount. Then, he drew his sword. It was so fast it was like lightning. A sword mind appeared that was difficult to understand. It was right in front of the Xenogeneic Viscount. It was too late, though. The Xenogeneic Viscount shouted and threw his weapons away. As his blood vessels almost burst, he used both hands in an attempt to stop the pirate bone sword that was quickly approaching. Hansen was not as strong as the Xenogeneic Viscount, and when his sword was grabbed, he couldn't push it onwards. Angry Steel and the Taurus warriors were all filled with happiness for a change. But the next second, their mood and color changed. 
The straight blade of the sword that the Xenogeneic Viscount had grabbed suddenly curved like a crescent moon. It created a weird angle, piercing into the Viscount's head. Chapter 1789 The Meeting of One Palm The whole battleground was deadly silent. The hand that had grabbed the pirate bone sword was depleted of its strength. Blood seeped out the back of the Viscount's head, and he crumpled to the floor. Xenogeneic Viscount hunted. Xenogeneic Gene found. Xenogeneic Beast Soul obtained. Steel Centaur. Hansen was so happy about this. He had obtained another Beast Soul, but he was still in the middle of a fight. He couldn't take a time out to examine it just yet. Where did this guy come from? Mike and the other barons were frozen. They couldn't believe any of this. A baron was surrounded by the angry Steel Army. He had not been killed, and he had managed to kill a Xenogeneic Viscount. It beggared belief. After the Xenogeneic Viscount was killed, the morale of the angry Steel Army began to wane. The assassination was serious stuff. Seeing it really dealt a blow to their resolve. Angry Steel's face turned red. He was bursting with a scary flame. He bowed to Mr. G and said, Mr. G, I am going to kill that Baron myself. After that, Angry Steel Earl flew towards Han Sr. Although it was embarrassing for an Earl to be forced to kill a Baron, now is not the time to be concerned with it if he couldn't kill Hansen now. It would be a tremendous loss for the angry Steel Army. He'd lose most of his reputation for sure. Everyone fall back, Mr. G said quietly. Angry Steel froze. He turned around and asked him, What did you say? Are you stupid? Or are your ears clocked? He just told you all to leave, the maid lifted her lips to say. But Angry Steel still wished to speak. This is your third time questioning the judgment of the master's command. The Taurus for bold. The maid looked at Angry Steel Earl coldly. A cold sweat broke out on Angry Steel Earl's forehead. He quickly bowed and said, Please do not be mad. I am wrong. I will tell them to retreat immediately. After that, he commanded his entire army to fall back. The centaur warriors were all shocked, but they didn't want to fight anymore, anyway. They were all happy to listen to the command and swiftly abandon the battle. You get lost, too. The maid looked at angry Steel Earl with disdain. If he wasn't useful, she would have killed him already for questioning Mr. G three times. Angry Steel did not say a word in response, and his face was expressionless. He didn't look at Mr. G and simply returned to the camp with his army. Hansen was shocked to see the army suddenly fall back. When the Kate that were boarding the ship saw the army retreat, they began to cheer. Laudrama and the barons, seeing what happened on the battlefield, looked nervous. They saw a shadow. Mr. G walked slowly onto the battlefield, along with the maid. Hansen, seeing Mr. G and the maid, looked shocked. They looked like Shura. Mr. G walked in front of Hansen and bowed before him, saying, I am a demon. My name is Luo G. May I ask what yours is? When Laudrama and Mike saw Mr. G, their faces grew pale. They did not know who Mr. G was in particular, but they knew what the people of Demon looked like. Demon was one of the higher races, unlike the Taurus. Demon? Hansen looked at Mr. G and then said, I'm human. The name's Dollar. Dollar? That's a good name. Luo G smiled, but he didn't care if it was a real or fake name. He continued on by saying, Dollar, you know that the Taurus are a subordinate race of ours? Yeah, Hansen answered. It's good that you know that. I'm not going to bully you, though. If you aren't damaged by my palm, I will let you go. I promise you that no one will subsequently try to bring you harm, Mr. G coldly said. What if I don't accept? Hansen asked. Hansen knew that if Mr. G wanted him dead, the man wouldn't have spoken to him as much as he already had. He was here for something, and he wasn't planning on killing him. If you do not accept, you will have to help me deal with something. And after that, you will be free to go, Mr. G said. That sounds fair, but you aren't a baron. Hansen lifted his lips. Mr. G laughed and said, I am a viscount, but when I use my palm, I will gauge it to a level that rivals yours. If you find out I use more power than I should, consider it my defeat. Okay, that'll settle it, Hansen agreed. Hansen had just fought several viscounts, but the demon Luo G was not like the centaurs. He wasn't at the same level. Luo G did give Hansen a sense of danger, though. Hansen didn't want to be reckless, walking into this. But with what was being offered, it didn't make much sense to reject. If their levels were going to be balanced, Hansen didn't think he'd have trouble dodging the palm. Luoji smiled and raised his right hand. 
His fingers were really long, and his skin was really pale. It looked like the hand of a young executioner. But when he lifted his hand fully, Han Sin's face changed. As his right hand was raised, it gathered up a weird power. It made no sound or sense, and normal people definitely wouldn't be able to feel it. But Han Sin was very familiar with this power. Many people had this power in his family, and he recognized it. The Falsified Sky Sutra? Han Sin's heart jumped. He looked at Luo Ji's hand in shock. Without a shadow of a doubt, the man was using falsified sky powers. Or the surer version of those powers. He knew he wasn't wrong. When Mr. G heard Han Sin's voice, he laughed and said, This power hails from the annals of my race. It is Sky Demon Sutra. If you can block it, I will never bother you again. Hansen wasn't familiar with the Sky Demon Sutra, but he knew it must be the same thing as falsified sky power. And Hansen also knew why Luo Ji was so confident in his ability to hurt him. Falsified sky powers never missed, and no ordinary combatant could ever block them. After Mr. G said that, he put his hand in front of him. He swung it like an orchestrator with a baton. It looked rhythmic, and it didn't even look as if there was much power in it. Not many people could block falsified sky powers. If that man used Viscount power against Hansen, he didn't think he could beat it, but Mr. G was using power that equated to Hansen's level. It was the hubris of arrogance. Chapter 1790, Human Dollar Hansen lifted his own palm as he faced off against Mr. G. The maid behind Mr. G smiled and looked on with disdain. She thought to herself, this person is arrogant. He thinks he is so great just for killing a few centaurs. He's actually using his own palm against the master, Pa. How dare he think he can compete with the Sky Demon Sutra? As she thought this, both palms collided. And because the power was equalized, they were both sent reeling back. Hansen knew this would happen, but Mr. G wasn't prepared. It looked as if he couldn't believe it. The maid's eyes and mouth opened wide, and she screamed. How is that possible? Do you still mean what you said? Hansen calmly asked Mr. G. That calm was only on the surface, though. After that strike, he knew he had just gone up against falsified sky powers. Does Demon have a connection to the Shura? Is Demon a race formed by the Shura in the Geno universe? Or are the Shura a part of Demon, perhaps? Hansen mulled potential answers for these questions, over and over. It was difficult to say. Mr. G wore a conflicted expression, and he said, I spoke the truth. You can leave, and no trouble will pursue you when you depart. After that, Mr. G said, and if you are willing to, we can make a trade. If you succeed, not only will trouble not follow you today, but you will never have trouble on planet Kate ever again. Furthermore, you will be granted a fine reward. What sort of trade? Hansen asked, looking at Mr. G. The implications were clear. Mr. G wouldn't touch Hansen for one day, but unless Hansen got on that airship, he couldn't run very far. Demon would control the entirety of planet Kate soon. If Hansen didn't want to get killed, he'd have to make this trade. Hansen was not afraid of being chased, but he wanted to at least hear what the terms might be. Hansen was also interested in learning why those of Demon were able to make use of falsified sky powers, and why they looked so similar to the Shura. This is not a place for talking, so let us discuss this somewhere else. Mr. G waved for Hansen to follow him. And without hesitation, Hansen accompanied him, and they both left together. After they left, all the Kate felt as if they had escaped death. Someone had recorded the fight and uploaded it to the internet. It created quite the fuss across many different races. It depicted a baron turning the streets into a killing field. Hansen's movement and sword skills garnered a lot of attention, in particular. They all wished to guess who he might have been. Many people knew about the pirate bone sword he had wielded. So, many guessed that he belonged to pirate. But pirate lacked people with techniques and talent as impressive as what the video showed. While the sword skills known by Pirate were strong, they were not as strong as Hansen's. The form Hansen had filled in on the ship was revealed. It identified his race as human, and his name is Dollar. No one had heard of humans before, so no one knew where Dollar might actually be from. But many creatures remembered that human and Dollar combo from that day onwards. It's that asterisk shoal. On a pirate ship, a beautiful young lady was watching the video. She gritted her teeth. It was higher. After she had been robbed, she set out in search of Hansen, but all traces of the man had vanished. She believed it would be extremely difficult to find him, 
and the last thing she wanted to hear was that a baron had made such bloody use of her pirate bone sword and killed a xenogenic viscount amidst it all. Haya watched the video and recognized both Han Sen and the sword. She was so mad, she really wanted to kill him. Higher, this dollar stole your sword. A man was also watching the video, and he looked greatly surprised. Yes, Uncle Rock. You need to teach him a proper lesson and get the sword back, Haya said to the man in a voice that she thought would sound cute. Although Haya hated Han Sen's guts, his display of power had impressed her. It would be difficult to find another fighter that could equal him, especially among the barons. She knew if she was to exact revenge, she couldn't do it alone. Rog sucked on a lollipop contemplatively. As he watched the video, he said, Powerful guy. I'm afraid someone of the same tier would not be able to kill him. He is just a baron. If you want to kill him, it shouldn't be difficult for you. Haya clutched his arms tight. Rog blinked and said, My little hire wants help, eh? But you do know that if one of us pirates seeks vengeance, we must do it by ourselves. Unless you die or something, of course. If I help you, Grandpa Pirate will kill me. Rock. Uncle. It is only the two of us. If we don't tell him, he won't know. Please help me. Haya started to swing his arms. Fine. Fine. Stop shaking me, Rock said. So, you agree? Haya sounded excited. I can't actually do this myself, of course. You'll have to get the sword yourself. Otherwise, Grandpa Pirate will kill me. Uncle. Rog sucked his lollipop with a smile, and then he said, I can most certainly help you level up to be a Viscount, though. He is strong, but if you are a Viscount, killing him won't be difficult. She looked upset at first, but after hearing his offer, she seemed much happier. She said, it would be good to kill that asterisk shoal myself. How can I level up to be a Viscount in a short amount of time? This is the genome material I was able to retrieve from a marquee whale. It is from the Lightning Sea. I made battle pills from it. The next time you practice, consume one. I believe that within 10 days, you can become a Viscount. Rog gave Hayo a bottle of the stuff. Hayo accepted the bottle and bared her teeth, saying, Dollar, I am going to take your life. Chapter 1791 Demon Grave Demon Grave? Hansen frowned and looked at Mr. G. Mr. G nodded and said, Yes, Demon Grave. It was an ordinary xenogenic space, but a battle once transpired there. Something went awry. Anyone who enters there now has their powers suppressed to the level of an ordinary bumpkin in Geno armor. Even a king would be like a commoner there, and the same applies to any weaponry that enters. There's a place like that? What happened there? Hansen asked. You have seen how powerful that Kong Fei is, yes? The one of no, Mr. G inquired. Hansen had a front row seat for that particular show. He nodded and said, Yes, I have. Demon Grave is the result of two elites like Kong Fei having a brawl, Mr. G said. It is useless to try and resist the suppression of that zone. Your strength won't mean squat there. You will be a commoner when you enter. The strongest people that opt to reside there are ones like you. It is true skill that sets them apart. When you are there, you might find yourself able to kill a king. Why am I going to that place with you? Hansen frowned. A place like that did indeed seem to be good for him. But Hansen didn't think he was invincible enough to march in blindly. The Geno universe, in one way or another, had the falsified Sky Sutra. Demon was not the strongest race, though, and that meant there were powers out there that were even greater than it. Hansen did not think Mr. G would be invincible if he went to this place. Furthermore, his power would be greatly suppressed. Death would find him easier there, so that wasn't good. The legends say two god elites fought for a treasure in Xenogenic space, and that was how the place became Demon Grave. I am unsure which of them might have managed to take this treasure, but after their battle, there were many Xenogenic plants. The fruit they bear is very mystic, and I will need just one of them. I am hoping you will be able to go with me to retrieve it. If you aid me in this venture, you will be highly rewarded, Mr. G said seriously. If these fruits can provide such a big benefit, and they are still there for the taking, this place must be quite dangerous, Hansen said. Mr. G did not want to hide these facts. He picked up some notes and then laid out everything he had gathered. Demon Grave has a lot of xenogenic plants, but there are no xenogenic creatures there. Don't worry. But inside the place, there is an indigenous race. They are the lesser sort of race that can only wear Geno armor. None of them can become nobles. Growing up there, however, 
allows them to munch on as much of the xenogenic fruit as they want. They cannot become proper barons, but their raw strength is higher than the average soldiers. They are roughly the equal of an average baron. Mr. G went on to say, if they are outside that place, it matters little how strong they are. They are, for all intents and purposes, rubbish. Inside Demon Grave, however, even a king might lose to them. They're our biggest enemy to fear. Hansen surveyed the information in front of him, and he found that most of the papers were drawings that had been done by hand. There weren't any actual videos or surveillance photos. You cannot use tools in there. This is all we have, so take a look, Mr. G explained. Hansen kept on looking at the pictures that had been drawn, though, and he admired the artistic qualities. The bodies of this race looked human-like, but they possessed butterfly wings. Their hair grew upwards like fire, and their bodies were like those of a human. They wore silver Geno armor, and they looked really nice. The documents said they were called Chaos. They were not nobles, and nor were they Xenogeneics. But their power could definitely be compared to that of a baron. They were nothing when they were out in the world, but they were scary inside their territory. Chaos ate the Xenogeneic fruit. While many others had ventured there, hoping to collect some even dukes, they were mostly killed. But when Hansen read the effects of those fruits, he was tempted. Hansen had 86 Baron Geno points, and that was because he consistently ate the materials and weapons he found. He hadn't cooked the horn arrows or the pirate bone sword. He did eat the toxic fong dagger, though. And after everything he consumed, he was still a while away from 100. He killed Great Axe Viscount, but there were no materials for him to retrieve. He couldn't get the dozen Baron Geno points he needed. After seeing the description of the xenogenic fruit, Hansen thought that maybe he'd be able to increase his own genes. If he could, he'd become a Viscount. But still, it depended on the fruit itself. And fruit aside, there was already a fairly good motive that could prompt him to go on this venture. If he was able to get a few of the fruits, he could at least swap them for materials, too. Aside from the one I need, you can keep any others you collect. If I get the fruit I want, I will give you a Viscount armor that was forged from Xenogeneic material. The defense of the gear is as good as it gets. When Mr. G said this, Hansen was unbelievably tempted to join him. Not only was it the prospect of Viscount armor, but being able to keep collected fruit was wondrous, too. Hansen really wanted to go. Mr. G, seeing Hansen not saying a word, still looked hesitant. So, he took out his phone and showed Hansen a visual of the armor. The armor was blue and made of scales. It looked like a fish scale armor set. Mr. G smiled and said, This Viscount armor is called Aqua Scale armor. It is made from the scales of Viscount Aqua scale snakes. Each snake only has one scale, so it took 265 to make this set. If you think I'm worth all this, then sure, I will come with you. Hansen smiled and agreed to the trip. He looked calm and composed, but inwardly, he was drooling over the potential rewards. 265 Viscount materials was incredible. Seeing the armor, Hansen didn't want to wear it. He wanted to eat it that set of armor could take him from Baron to Viscount, and from Viscount to Earl. That was not an armor set. That was a recovery soup. Chapter 1792 Crystal Fruits Mr. G told Hansen that the Aquascale snakes were a powerful race, but of the lesser variety. They were strong enough to challenge the higher races that were in the Geno Hall. They had tried once but fell short of being able to claim a lantern. The high race had killed almost all of them in return for the boldness. The aquascale armor was made from the xenogenic snakes that had died in the battle. It eventually came into Demon's possession, and then Mr. G's personal ownership. This trip to Demon Grave was important, and it had been very difficult to find someone of Han Sen's caliber to help. Therefore, the price was of no object. After accepting Mr. G's invitation, Hansen noticed not just anyone could travel to Demon Grave. When Demon Grave was created, a few of the higher races established a rule. They could send people in whenever the entrance opened up, but only within certain limitations. Demon was a part of the ensemble that had made this rule. They could send a group of four inside, but two of the party had to be demons. Since two members of the party had already been chosen, Mr. G only had one space remaining. He was originally planning on bringing his maid, but after seeing Hansen, he changed his mind. He preferred to bring Hansen instead of her. Mr. G wasn't stupid, though. He had insurance to make sure that Hansen tried his hardest the maid was an Earl Elite, 
and there'd be other demons on standby outside. Things wouldn't turn out very well for Hansen if Mr. G didn't return alive. Demon Grave's entrance was near Planet Kate, but because it was not yet open, Mr. G had been waiting around, observing how the Taurus attacked. He could not believe that he had stumbled across someone like Hansen here, of all places. Two days later, Mr. G took Hansen with him to leave Planet Kate's surface. They didn't go far, though. The entrance to Demon Grave was on a natural satellite that orbited Planet Kate. Because of the fight, the energy of Demon Grave was erratic and volatile. Sometimes, Demon Grave would suppress elites so strongly that they would die before they could even set foot on the ground. So, the only option was to enter during a fluctuation of the atmospheric energy. They would enter when the energy was weak and leave before it became strong again. Hansen followed Mr. G to a base that the elites had built. There were no other higher races there. The guards in the base said that one demon had already taken a person into Demon Grave. Mr. G took Hansen out of the base, headed for a barren planet. Mr. G told Hansen he had arrived late on purpose, and so they wouldn't be entering with the others. The natural satellite was the size of the moon, so it wasn't big. It was very empty, too. It was covered in yellow sand and cactus-like plants. When he stepped out of the base, he noticed that the sand stretched out to endless horizons. Rather than being on a tiny moon, it just felt like he was in a random desert somewhere. Hansen knew he had entered Demon Grave, however. This was the result of the xenogenic space's dimensional twisting. Mr. G, as he kept on walking, told Hansen, We have entered Demon Grave now, and there is something I must tell you. Go ahead. Hansen was not surprised by this. Before he had agreed to come, he knew some sort of information had been kept from him. The fruit that we're after this time is special, even for Demon's Grave. But it also means we have to go in deep. It is in the land heavily ruled by chaos. So, we need to ensure we are prepared, Mr. G said. Hansen shrugged his shoulders and did not say anything in response. Even though Mr. G had not told him this before, it was something he already expected. He was offering a lot to Hansen, so there had to be something unusually dangerous involved. That meant Mr. G wouldn't have been very confident in the venture, either, if he was to go alone. He really wanted Hansen to go with him. Inside Demon Grave, our lives are tethered. If you die, I die. If you live, I live. So, if there is anything I need to know, it is best you tell me now. Don't hold back something that will bite us in the asterisk SS later, Mr. G said. Hansen smiled and said, Don't worry. This is a trade. You're paying for the service, so we each have an obligation. You? Money? Me? Effort? We humans have standards. Hearing him say that, Mr. G did not respond. With Hansen in tow, he continued moving forward. Not long after, Hansen felt a little sick. He was feeling weak. After a few dozen more miles, he was feeling extra tired. Demon Grave suppresses outsiders a lot. We are weakened a considerable amount, be careful. If you see the chaos, hide. It is best to try to avoid fighting them. Mr. G was not faring any better, either. He was sweating, and he was visibly struggling against the suppression. After a dozen miles more, the desert turned a little gray. They were approaching an oasis, and it spurred them to walk a little faster. It looks like we're on the right path. The map said we'd encounter an oasis. There's a chance we can get some xenogenic fruit here without trouble. Mr. G looked excited, but they were still very cautious as they walked forward. They didn't want to stumble into the chaos. As for the other powerful races that had entered Demon Grave, Mr. G said not to worry. He had chosen a very dangerous path that would lead them to the chaos camp. Normal people wouldn't go there. They didn't sense anything living in the oasis as they approached. When they entered, they found many grape-like fruits, which were reddish-purple in color. They were so heavy, they bent the vines they grew upon. And there were a lot of them. Are these the xenogenic fruits? Hansen looked at them with surprise. They're not. They're just ordinary fruit. We'll have to look deeper. The xenogenic fruit we seek will look like crystals, Mr. G said. Hansen followed the grape vines, and a little later, he found a grape that looked very special. Just like Mr. G had said, it looked crystalline, like a piece of jade. Just as Hansen reached out to pick it up, he felt danger coming his way. He quickly fell back and looked at the vine. Chapter 1793, Isha When Mr. G saw Hansen jump back, he immediately put himself in battle mode. He looked toward the grapevine ahead of them. Mr. G, you are good. 
Even your mere servant is so sensitive. A voice sounded from the grapevine before someone walked out. Hansen observed the body approaching and noted it was a woman wearing a battle suit. The mask she wore obscured her face, however. On her head, she had white bunny ears. Hansen and Mr. G were facing her, so they couldn't see if she also had a tail. Hanging on her back, though, was a saw-like knife. It was a little savage, especially when compared with her body shape. Mr. G looked at the woman and said coldly, What is one of the rebate doing here? The woman, still sounding casual, said, Whatever you're doing here, I want to do, too. That means we're enemies. Mr. G gave Hansen a signal before approaching the woman slowly. His hand hovered above the sword attached to his waist. Hansen understood the signal and moved to flank the woman. He walked toward her from the other side. The woman remained where she stood, as if she hadn't seen the pair coming toward her. She merely said, Three miles to the north of the oasis, there is a group of chaos. If I shout, or the sounds of your weapons ring, they will be drawn here. Are you sure you want to do this now? I don't stand for bluffing. Mr. G laughed. If there were no chaos, why would I be here? Go ahead, if you don't believe me. We can all die together. The woman didn't buckle easily to the implied threat, and she held her ground resolutely. That made Mr. G hesitate a bit, too. He stopped approaching her and gestured for Hansen to keep an eye on her. Hansen nodded. Mr. G started sneaking in a northerly direction until he was out of sight. You don't belong to Demon, the woman remarked. She didn't sound hostile when she spoke. You're right, I am human, Hansen answered. How did you know I was here? The woman asked Hans Senator she appeared to have been confused. The woman was definitely not an ordinary rebate. If Mr. G knew her true identity, he'd have been shocked. And he wouldn't have believed he was seeing her here, of all places. Hansen didn't say anything more, and he simply continued to look at the woman. The woman picked a grape and reclined back against a giant vine. She skinned the grape and placed it in her mouth. As she ate it, she said, What is Mr. G giving you? Whatever it is, I can double the offer. If you help me later, of course. Hansen was shocked that the woman so boldly wanted him to betray Mr. G. She had made the offer so casually, as if it was entirely normal. Seeing Hansen not give her an answer, the woman went on to say, I'm afraid I am uncertain what Mr. G is hoping to accomplish. He's told you that he wants a xenogenic fruit. Am I right? If you believe that, you are dreadfully wrong. I can tell you right here, for free, that this xenogenic fruit he has told you about is not the only thing that he wants. This place is extremely dangerous, so I suggest you think about this, lest you go and get yourself killed. This is none of my business, Hansen said calmly. Even if the woman hadn't said anything like this, he still had his own suspicions. You are an interesting fellow. My name is Isha. What's yours? The woman looked at Hansen with genuine interest. Dollar, Hansen answered. The woman's expression said that she had never heard of humans nor a person named Dollar. The video of Hansen laying waste to the centaurs hadn't been circulating for very long. Perhaps she hadn't gotten around to seeing it yet. The woman seemed to think of something else, too. But she then appeared to quickly shelve the idea. The grapevines began to rustle, and a little later, Mr. G came marching out towards them. Mr. G looked grim. It seemed as if Isha had not been lying, and he had seen the chaos. How long have you been here? And how long have the chaos been in this area? Mr. G asked the woman. Is that how you ask people for information? This is the grace and etiquette of the demons on full display? Isha asked sarcastically. Mr. G looked at Isha. He had seen the rebate before, but he didn't know a ton about them. What is your name, lady? Mr. G asked politely, not seeming angered by her questions. Isha, Isha answered. Mr. G receded into thought for a moment, and he tried to imagine where he might have heard that name before. Mr. G smiled and went on to say, Lady Isha, if we have come here for the same purpose and waltzed into the same predicament, why don't we cooperate? How? Isha asked emotionlessly. We deal with the chaos, of course. And once that is done, we can go our separate ways. Finding the reward will be up to our individual effort again. What do you think? Mr. G smiled with his suggestion. Okay, how would you propose we deal with the chaos? Do you think the three of us can take down four? Isha asked. Mr. G shook his head. They might come at us in a group, in which case their number's advantage will be difficult to deal with. So, what is the plan? Isha said. 
I have heard the rebate excel in both speed and agility. You are the best of the higher races in those fields. If you can lure the chaos into the oasis, Han Sin and I will strike. If we can take down two, the other two can be taken out easily. Mr. G looked sincere. Mr. G, that is such a great plan. Minor suggestion. How about you lure them out, instead? Isha said drilly. Mr. G responded quietly, we don't have the movement capabilities of the rebate. And if we detected you when you were attempting to go unnoticed, the chaos definitely will. It is best that Han Sen and I perform the sneak attack. Isha frowned and thought. Then, surprisingly, she said, Okay, I will lure out the chaos. But I want half of the spoils. The other half goes to you too. Sure. Mr. G smiled. After the three of them settled on the plan, Hansen and Mr. G went into hiding. Isha was going to attract the chaos. After Isha left, Mr. G told Hansen, When Isha lures them here, don't do anything. We will slide out of the oasis without being noticed. Chapter 1794 Chaos Hansen frowned, but he didn't have much of an opinion about Mr. G breaking promises. Mr. G and Isha's purposes were similar, so that did make them competitors. It was to be expected that they would fight and trick each other when cooperating. The reason Hansen frowned, however, was because of Isha. He thought she had agreed too quickly to the idea of luring the chaos there, and that she herself was planning to betray them. If they left now, they might lose an advantage. While Hansen was still in thought, a noise came from further into the oasis. From where they were hiding, they could see Isha was running towards them with haste. Isha was incredibly fast, but she didn't look to be too concerned or rushed. Several arrows flew through the air right past her. It was a terrifying scene for Hansen to watch. Her abilities of movement were not inferior to Hansen's own Dongshin movements. Not far behind Isha, for Chaos were flapping their wings in pursuit they had bows, and they were repeatedly firing arrows down at her. Their power and speed were scary, as well. Inside Demon Grave, Hansen was probably much slower than they were. The Chaos looked just like the artistic renditions he had previously seen. They were clad in silver armor, and they possessed butterfly wings. Their bows were forged from wood or sturdy vines. Isha was able to avoid the four of them as she ran back to the oasis. She hadn't been dealt an injury, which was rather amazing. When Isha ran into the oasis, she followed the current plan and went for the grapevine. There were a lot of vines there, and visibility was severely limited. The chaos flew down to the ground and began making their way through the vines. The backs of their wings were weird. When they were open, they were open wider than a man with his arms stretched out. When they closed, they threaded together to look like a cape. The four chaos were next to them now. Hansen looked towards Mr. G, who was looking back at him, shaking his head. He was telling Hansen not to do anything. The four chaos did not notice Hans' sound or Mr. G's lurking presences. But after they had passed, Mr. G signaled for Hansen to go to where the chaos had initially come from. Hansen followed Mr. G out of the oasis, but not long after they left, they heard an angry shriek from behind. The four chaos suddenly appeared, coming right for them. Mr. G and Hansen's hearts jumped. There had been no fighting in the oasis, and yet, the monsters were now coming right for them. Isha was nowhere to be seen, either. That was weird. They did not know how Isha had gotten rid of the chaos, but the four creatures had obviously reversed direction. They were clearly coming for Hansen and Mr. G now. The pair couldn't spend much time thinking it over, though, and so they focused on trying to run. While they might not have been able to outrun the creatures, they couldn't just stand around doing nothing. After running a few steps, Hansen quickly realized that they couldn't escape this predicament he shouted at Mr. G and said, run back to the oasis. We can't proceed like this. Okay, Mr. G agreed, and he quickly turned around. Hansen turned around, too. He wanted to return to the oasis. There would be foliage and other things that could be used to block and confuse the creatures. Hansen ran for a while, but Mr. G did not come back. He kept on running the other way, using Hansen to get rid of the chaos. Hansen stayed silent, though, and he did not turn around. He kept going back towards the oasis. The chaos were moving incredibly fast, and Hansen had been running for a while, hoping to breach the oasis from another side. All of a sudden, though, he slid to a stop. Many arrows came flying forward. Hansen quickly employed Heavenly Go and his Dongshin movements. 
As he bobbed to evade each arrow, he continued heading for the oasis. The four chaos had been unable to shoot Hansen, so they instead drew their swords and swooped closer. They wanted to stop Hansen from entering. Hansen didn't use his pirate bone sword, though. A xenogenic weapon like that would be weaker in such a place. Using it here would be a great waste, and if it ended up getting broken, that'd be terrible. Amidst Hans Sin's dodging, he decided to try to pick up the wooden arrows that had been fired at him. He threw them back at two of the chaos and rolled. Then, he picked up another two wooden arrows. He threw those at the other two. The chaos chopped the approaching arrows down with their wooden swords and continued after Hans Sr. Hansen grabbed more wooden arrows, using them as melee weapons to deflect incoming sword strikes. Ping. The sword hit his arrows with devastating force, and Hansen stumbled back with bleeding hands. His chest ached, and he coughed up a little blood. Before Hansen landed, a chaos was running at him again with its sword drawn. It wanted to cut Hansen in two while he was still in the air. But Hansen moved like a bird and avoided the strike. He threw a wooden arrow toward the two chaos that were running at him. The two chaos swung their swords to cut the arrow down, but suddenly, the arrow moved low and went past them. Hansen thought Drillhead could be of benefit since he was using the arrows at such short range. But the speed and skill of the two that came against him now were too much. They dodged the arrow that had come right before their throats. These guys are hard to deal with. Hansen thought in his heart he didn't stop moving, though. And while those two dealt with the arrow, he went to face the last chaos ahead. That chaos was a woman. Her wooden sword was not heavy like those of the other three. She swung her sword like it was a banyan branch. A multitude of shadows flashed through the air toward Hansen, like a net ready to snare him. But Hansen did not hesitate. If the three chaos caught up, escape would be incredibly difficult. Like a ghost, Hansen headed towards the net with his horn arrow in hand. Catcha. The Viscount rank horn arrow was struck by the wooden sword and broken. But Hansen used this chance to escape the sword net and before he had time to feel sad over his loss, he was headed for the oasis. The four chaos continued shouting angrily, but none were able to stop Han Senator, and in the midst of the oasis, it was easy for him to hide. After a few more dodges, he was able to race into the grapevines. Chapter 1795, The Fight on the Statue After entering the area with the grapevines, things became much easier for Han Sr. The fighting skills that the four chaos employed were rather simple and a little clumsy, but they weren't weak. One versus one, Hansen might win. But against four of them at the same time, there was a high chance he could stumble and fall. Hansen used all the judgment, prediction, and movement that his skills gave him. He did this so he could fight them more effectively in the grapevine area. Hansen kept escaping in the direction that Isha had fled. But Isha herself was now headed in the direction Mr. G had gone so Han Sin was unable to see her. If she had not been killed, she should still be in the grape area. Han Sin was still curious about how she had managed to get rid of the chaos that were chasing her. The four chaos ardently pursued Han Senator, he was able to kite and keep them at bay, though, keeping them from dealing any damage to him. In this manner, they went deep into the grapevines. In the beginning, Han Sin could catch glimpses of Isha's trail. But after going this deep, he had lost sight of it. What did she do? Hansen frowned. He was fighting for chaos all alone, hoping to find something that could help him out of the bind. The grapevines there were very big. They were as thick as a man's leg, and they tangled together like snakes. They webbed and clogged the skies, making it difficult for sunlight to pierce through and illuminate the undergrowth. The whole place was like one labyrinthine cave system. Hansen wouldn't have dared go this deep if he didn't know there were no xenogenics there. Hansen thought the complicated geography could weaken the resolve of the chaos. But they seemed to be very familiar with the place, and Hansen still couldn't shake them off his tail. The Dongxian armor absorbed the power and strength of the earth, but it was very limited where they were right now. Perhaps it was because of the atmosphere that had been damaged by the two elites so long ago. And consequently, the barren Dongxian armor was suppressed. To make matters worse, without the constant replenishment, the energy he was using was starting to make him feel tired. When Hansen wondered whether or not he should risk trying to take a hostage, he suddenly saw something bright. The vines seemed to be opening in front of him, and the sunlight was extra bright there. It was being reflected by something, and Hansen assumed it might be water. Hansen did not know how he had gotten here. He ran forward, and lo and behold, 
he saw a lake that was skirted by the rest of the oasis vines. A statue stood in the middle of the lake, and surprisingly, Isha was there. Isha was sitting on the shoulder of the statue. She looked surprised when she saw Hansen emerge from the knot of vines. But when Hansen left the vines and approached the shores of the lake, he heard the chaos make warning sounds. They were warning Hansen not to venture too close to it. Hansen didn't care for what they thought, though, and he just continued on towards the lake. He jumped to Isha's statue. The statue was sculpted to look like a person. It sort of looked like a human or a crystallizer. There were no butterfly wings, cat ears, or tail of any sort. It was just a three-meter-tall person with clothes on. The lower part of its legs was submerged beneath the surface of the lake. When Hansen jumped, the chaos stopped near the shore. They gave up their chase, and neither did they fire any more arrows. Hansen flew to the left shoulder of the statue. Isha, who was on the right shoulder of the statue, drew out her saw-like knife. She slashed it at Hans Sr. Hansen had seen many powerful skills, like falsified sky sword skills, but this was scary. There were many swordsmen in the sanctuary, and lots of them were masters. But Hansen had never seen someone as cruel as she was before. Most sword skills he had seen so far were intended for slashing or stabbing. Sometimes they were fast and powerful, but Isha's skills were weird. It looked like she was slashing and stabbing at the same time, like some toxic snake, or the fangs of a hungry wolf. She was so fast, Hansen could not determine the track of her attack. Hansen didn't spare much time thinking this over, though. He used his powers to take to the air like a bird. He tried to dodge Isha, but he was suppressed and unable to tell where she was attacking from. The suppression slowed him down, and while he did manage to mostly dodge the strike, he was slashed across the arm. Hansen did not know what that savage saw knife was made of, but it cut straight through his armor and sliced him deeply enough to expose his bones. Luckily, Hansen's blood was crystallized. Melting his blood would be difficult under the suppressive atmosphere, so no actual blood seeped through the wound. Having failed to stop Hansen, she lifted her weapon to strike again. She was going faster and faster, with more strength in each subsequent lunge. She was like some toxic beast opening its mouth to bite Hans Sr. Hansen was in the air, flying like a bird. He tried to gain more distance to dodge Isha's attacks. Isha was still standing on the statue, though. Eventually, she was unable to reach Hans Senator. She didn't chase him, and it seemed as if she only wanted Hansen off the statue. But it was apparent by the look on her face that Isha was surprised. She was stunned that Hansen had managed to dodge her attack. Hansen was in the air, thinking over what had happened. Isha was far stronger than he had imagined she would be. Her attacks were almost as good as Hansen's. She was definitely a master with the blade. She deliberately let go of Hansen and Mr. G and it seemed like she had been using them as more than just bait. Perhaps she was staying here, not because of the chaos, but something else. Perhaps she had a plan that involved the lake, the statue, and maybe the entire oasis itself. Hansen felt as if he couldn't use all his strength. If he had enough energy, he could fly freely and not worry about falling. But inside Demon Grave, Hansen really was weak. Flying like he was, he had already lost much of his power. He wouldn't last much longer. Hansen looked at the lake and noticed how clear the water was. He could see the bottom of the small lake. The water reflected light very strongly, though. The reflections would hurt your eye. There were no creatures in the lake, and neither was there anything like seaweed. But even so, with the fact that none of the chaos would approach, Hansen did not have a good feeling about the place. Hansen gritted his teeth and circled around in the air before trying to return to the statue. Chapter 1796, Super Jean? Isha saw Hansen coming back for the statue and swung her sword again. The sword moved like a subtle dragon, and it wasn't as obvious as Hansen's approach. Her sword mind was not any weaker than Hansen's. In fact, she was the most difficult enemy Hansen had faced since entering the Geno universe. He didn't have a weapon, and he didn't dare to use his pirate bone sword to challenge her saw knife. All he could rely on was his movement abilities as he flew around the statue, trying to get on it. But Isha's agility and sword skills were in no way inferior to Hans Senator when she waved her saw knife. She prevented Hansen from being able to reach the statue. Hansen flew around the statue three times, eventually feeling as if he had exhausted all the power in his body. If he didn't borrow some power from another source soon, he'd likely fall into the water below. Let's try this and see if it works. Hansen summoned something in his hands. 
the light became a steel shield. The steel shield was one meter high, and it was made of good steel. In the front, there was a carving of a centaur roaring up to the sky. This was the Viscount Beast Soul Steel Centaur. It was a shield beast soul. Hansen had not tried it out yet, and he didn't know if it would be weakened by a demon grave. But he had to do something, and using it now seemed like the best idea. Hansen lifted the steel shield to cover his entire body. He forced himself onto the statue's shoulder. When Isha attacked this time, Hansen did not retreat. Not that he could, as there was no space to move backward. If he could not maintain a position on the statue, he'd stumble back and fall into the lake. Dong. Isha slashed the shield and heard a metallic noise ring out. Hansen's body moved back a bit, but he still managed to recompose himself and stay firmly on the statue's shoulder. Isha looked shocked by this. Her eyes looked at Hansen's shield, unable to believe it had managed to block her saw knife and save Hansen's life. The serrated knife was like a mouthful of teeth, heading right for Hans Sr. But Hansen had already regained his footing on the statue, and now his stance was firm. He had a shield to block Isha's saw knife. He wasn't afraid anymore. They were both fighting atop the statue, and Isha's sword skills still proved themselves to be tremendously spooky. But Hansen was hiding behind the shield. She slashed dozens of times, but she failed to break the steel surface of the shield. Hansen was thrilled. Apparently, demon grave suppression had no effect on beast souls. Therefore, beast souls were very handy to have in that place. Hansen hated himself for not having any other beast souls right now. If he had a bunch, he'd practically be invincible in this place. Isha continued fighting for a while, but eventually stopped. She stood on the right shoulder of the statue, staring at Hans and who stood atop the left shoulder. She said, Why aren't you following Luoji? Why did you come back this way? Hansen shrugged his shoulders. Keeping himself behind the safety of the shield, he sat down carefully and said, Mr. G ran off so I decided to come back here. Isha stared at Han Sin and sat down as well. She felt exhausted after doing so much fighting, too. She was a noble belonging to one of the higher races, but the demon grave had an even worse effect on her. Her body was no greater than Han Sin's in this place. Now that Han Sin had the time to look over the statue properly, he noticed that there was a word engraved on the statue's neck. The carving was a little rough, as if it had been added after the statue was made. Hansen looked a little closer, and when he did, he was given a shock. He knew those words. They weren't Kate characters. It was a language belonging to ancient humans. Super Gene? Two words followed by a question mark. When he saw those words, Hansen was shocked. The most shocking thing was how familiar the writing looked. Hansen had previously seen a note written by his great granddad Han Jinji. It had said Super Gene? Now, the same words and question mark were on this thing. The handwriting was identical, too. Hansen looked at the words as his mind raced. Han Jinji was here? Why did he write this down? Why is there a question mark? Why is Isha here? There were so many questions racing through Hansen's head, but he could not come up with any answers. Do you know these words? Isha suddenly asked Han Sr. Hansen was wearing his Dongshin armor, so she could not see his face. But Hansen had jerked slightly when he saw it, and he had stared at it for too long. I can read a bit. Hansen did not deny it. Isha looked happy and asked, What does it say? Hansen looked at Isha and her smile and said, What's written there is not complicated. Tell me why you are here. Isha immediately frowned and said, I know something is strange about this place. Perhaps there is treasure waiting to be found. Do I look retarded? Hansen asked, looking at her. No, Isha was shocked. Then don't treat me like I am. Hansen lifted his lips. The scene went quiet. Hansen began looking over the statue to see if he could find any other writing. If Han Jinji really did write those words, he wouldn't have done so for no reason. Hansen looked everywhere, but there were no other words. It was quite disappointing. And furthermore, he could no longer see the chaos. He wasn't sure where they had gone off to. Who does this statue represent? Is it be a human or a crystallizer? Hansen wondered. Suddenly, the sound of bubbles was heard from down below. He looked down to the lake, and it seemed as if the water beneath them was boiling. But Hansen didn't feel as if the lake was getting any hotter. And there were so many bubbles emerging, you could not even see beyond the surface. Dollar, do you want to live or die? Isha asked suddenly, looking at Hans Sr. Chapter 1797, Treasure in the Lake. What do you mean? 
Hansen asked with a frown. If you want to live, listen to me and follow my instructions closely. If you want to die, death can come easily. Just take a look at the wound on your arm for assurance, Isha said coldly. Hansen was shocked, and he looked at the wound on his arm. The tear on the Dongxian armor was still there. It was difficult to recover in that place, but despite that, his wound had already healed. Han Sen's healing abilities were remarkable. He had a xenogenic body, so he wouldn't bleed. His healing abilities were better than the average Viscounts. After examining his wound, he determined that his arm was in good shape. His wound was going to be fine, and there wouldn't even be a scar. But just as Hansen started to answer her, he felt pain stem from his wound. Somehow, the mostly healed skin had come undone. In a second, the wound had reopened as if he had just been injured. He almost cried aloud. Isha said quietly, you were hit by my teeth power. If I want to, I can ensure your body never heals, and any recovery you make can be broken. I can do this repeatedly until your entire body breaks. Even if you leave Demon Grave and find a King Class Elite for aid, not even they will be able to break my teeth power. Not that you could find someone like that, but it would only take two weeks for me to rip up your whole body. Hansen did not respond, but he could definitely feel that his wound was slowly tearing wider. It was slow, but difficult to control. It felt like there were a number of teeth in the wound, digging into his body. He tried to control it, but he could not stop the skin of him tearing further and further. The only reason it would take me two weeks is because of your ability not to bleed. If you did bleed, you'd be dead within a day. Isha looked at Hansen's wound. Hansen's bloodless wound was a strange sight for her. Her teeth power could break through flesh and speed up any bleeding process. Even those who incurred the slightest of wounds would bleed profusely, but Hansen hadn't bled a drop. Hansen's face didn't change, and he asked Isha, What do you want me to do? If you want me to die, you don't have to say that. Isha sighed and told him emotionlessly, I need you to do nothing. Hansen understood what she meant. She wanted him to stay where he was, do nothing, and avoid disturbing her. If you can stand still, you won't disturb my business. We can avoid a feud, and I promise you that when we leave this place, I will remove the teeth powers I have inflicted upon you, Isha said. Hansen neither agreed nor disagreed, but he did say, as long as you're not putting me in danger, I can abide. Isha frowned. She was not happy with Hansen's manner of promise. More and more bubbles were appearing in the water like a large jacuzzi. The bubbles had lovely acoustics, with their constant popping. But amongst the many bubbles, Hansen saw a black bag. What it was, he did not know. Remember what you have told me. Otherwise, you'll be wishing you were dead, Isha told Hansen threateningly. She stared at the black thing in the lake, then, ignoring Han Sr. What is that? Hansen looked at it. Isha ignored him. She continued staring at the lake, as if he did not exist. Hansen, getting ignored, did not speak. He was thinking if there was some manner of nice treasure down below, he'd like to steal it. He didn't believe the promise Isha had made him. Once they left Demon Grave, it was likely she wouldn't remove the teeth power. It was possible she'd just kill him. Isha took whatever was inside the lake seriously. If he could steal whatever it was, even if he could not use it himself, it might work as leverage over Isha. Whatever the thing in the water was, it was moving faster and it produced a large number of waves. But then, suddenly, it burst out of the froth of bubbles. When Hansen was finally able to see the item, he was shocked. Hansen had expected to see something like a fish or a snake. He wouldn't even have been surprised if it was a dead body, as anything could happen in that place. But when Hansen saw a scabbard come out of the water, he was shocked. It would make sense if it was a blade, as it could easily be deemed as a treasure of some worth or perhaps even a Geno armament like the Northern King Glove. But it was just a scabbard that jumped out of the lake, minus a blade it could house. What use would a plain scabbard be for three no arm cool? The scabbard was black, but it wasn't a matte color. It was crystalline, like some sort of black diamond. The scabbard hopped out of the lake like a fish. Its movement looked almost happy. What is this scabbard? Hansen asked. When Isha continued ignoring him, Hansen summoned his last horn arrow. He was going to shoot at the black crystal scabbard. What are you doing? Isha was shocked, and her saw knife immediately swung toward Han Sr. Hansen ducked behind his shield and laughed. I hate being lonely. If you don't talk to me, perhaps I will do something weird. Don't take it out on me if I happen to ruin your business here. 
Isha's teeth were getting itchy. If someone like Hansen had spoken to her in such a manner outside of Demon Grave, she could have had him killed a million times over with a mere wag of her finger. Rebate Sword Queen was half a god. Even kings tended to avoid her. No one had permission to speak to her in such a way. When I leave this place, I will kill you. Isha was very angry, but there was nothing she could do. If Hansen wanted to ruin her business and steal the scabbard, there was nothing she could do to stop him. What is this scabbard? Hansen asked. Have you heard about the crystallizers? If you haven't, then you wouldn't understand, Isha said coldly. Chapter 1798 Crystal Geno Weapon Of course I have heard about them. Is that scabbard related to the crystallizers? Hansen's heart jumped, but he held his emotions in check and kept his voice flat. If you know, then why do you ask? Isha replied icily. I have heard about this race, but I do not know much about them. Please explain it to me, but please be aware. If I am bored, I may do something unpredictable. Hansen smiled as he fondled the horn arrow. Isha hated Hansen, but she clamped down on her anger and said, the crystallizes were a new race of the Geno universe. They were here for a short amount of time, and their evolution process was fairly average. In fact, it was worse than some of the lesser races. But the crystallizes were wonderful with Geno technology. They created a crystal Geno weapon that could enable normal Geno fighters to battle against dukes, marquis, and even kings. Something that strong resides here? Hansen was shocked. He thought the crystallizes had been unable to become strong and had thus been destroyed. But with her saying this now, he was learning that while their bodies were not strong, their weapons did not seem weak. Isha ignored Hansen and continued to speak. After the crystallizers created their crystal Geno weapons, they grew in strength. They were ambitious, and they even sought to claim a position in the Geno Hall. But their strongest leader was merely a duke. He wasn't even a king-class fighter. No race with such limited power had ever tried to challenge a position in the Geno Hall before. But they failed. It seems like the crystallizers' crystal Geno weapons were inferior to those of kings. Hansen could predict how it all ended. Isha looked at him with disdain and said, Shut up if you don't know anything. The crystallizers' crystal Geno weapons were as good as the king's. If they challenged ordinary higher races, they might have indeed lit up a lantern. But they were too strong, and they invented a Geno weapon that was greater than the gods. And with that Geno weapon, they challenged a most mighty higher race. And the god elites of this higher race destroyed them. They disappeared shortly after. Hansen was shocked. He hadn't known the crystallizes were that great. And so it came as a surprise. Could this scabbard be the crystal Geno weapon that is able to slay a god? Hansen looked at the scabbard in the lake and became very excited. Isha said, You think it's here? You think such a thing would still reside in a place like this? Who knows? Maybe no one knows. Hansen smiled. Isha said, you think too much. Power doesn't just appear as if out of nowhere. And the crystallizers were only able to craft a single one of those crystal Geno weapons. And yet they still failed. They weren't able to kill a god, not even a deified elite. The crystal Geno weapon was reduced to dust many races saw that happen, so a lot of them know. But after a while, the memory of the crystallizers has faded. Many cannot recall anything about them. What is this scabbard, then? Hansen blinked. It's an ordinary variant of those crystal Geno weapons. If it was complete, then it might carry one in a fight versus Duke-class foes. Perhaps even King-class. Now all that remains is the scabbard, and so its strength is decreased, Isha said. Hansen didn't believe her, as he knew very little about her. But with her battle skills, it was clear to see that she was not an ordinary person from a higher race. She could be a Duke or King herself. A character like her would not enter a place like this in search of an incomplete crystal Geno weapon. Hansen stared at the scabbard and said, Two elites once fought here. They fought over a treasure. That is why this xenogenic space has such strange suppressive properties. Might this be the item they were fighting over? Your imagination is quite something, Isha said coldly. Hansen wanted to squeeze more information out of her, but the lake suddenly moved. The scabbard flew towards them like an arrow. Isha immediately became happy, as no more talking could follow. So, she reached out to grab the scabbard as it flew. She had only been talking to keep Hansen occupied and calm. He hadn't done anything to disrupt the scabbard, just like she planned. And now that it was flying forward, she could happily ignore Hans Senator as soon as she grabbed the scabbard. Her work would be finished, 
and she could kill Han's senator, he would be her first kill with it. The scabbard flew to the forehead of the statue, fitting itself neatly into a slot that Hansen had noticed there. Hansen originally thought that slot was something of a decoration. It might even have represented a third eye, but now he knew it was not anything like that. It was instead a slot for the scabbard. Hansen had no idea why the scabbard would be drawn to the slot. Hansen thought about it quickly, and he saw Isha on the adjacent shoulder. She was reaching out to catch the scabbard. Hansen threw a punch, aiming towards Isha's hands. Isha looked murderous, and she swung her sword. Luckily, Hansen was able to dodge it. If he hadn't, he'd have lost his hand. Hansen's other fist came into contact with Isha's other hand, though. There was a pang sound, and both of them flinched backward. Neither of the two caught the scabbard. The scabbard flew past the pair, fitting itself neatly into the slot on the forehead of the statue. There wasn't a single seam, and it fit inside perfectly. How dare you? Isha looked extremely glum, and she couldn't stand his presence anymore. Whoever sees it gets to share. I should have half of it, right? Hansen smiled. Do you think I can't kill you? Isha lifted her knife and looked at Han Senator. Her body was suddenly blazing with a purple fire. Anger was definitely the fuel. I thought demon grave suppressed powers, and not even kings could overcome that. So, what is this? Hansen's face changed. This was bad. Chapter 1799, Archery Queen Isha hated Hans Senator, her power was amassing, building in strength. The purple flame broke through the enforced limit of Demon Grave. The power in her body was increasing, but breaking through the power limit did not mean the suppression of Demon Grave was ineffective. Isha's power was too strong, so she broke past a limit she was crossing a line that allowed her to use a power that was not supposed to be in play there. Only elites like Isha, who were halfway to becoming a god, had the power to do this. Not even an average king class could accomplish the same thing. Because Isha was only half deified, she could not completely ignore the supposed limitations of Demon Grave. Her dramatic flare of power wasn't actually as big of an improvement as it seemed. Still, she could ignore enough of Demon Grave's suppression to raise her power to that of a Viscount. Forcing her body to wield power like this was a definite strain. Even if she didn't fight, Simply holding the power would damage her. If Hansen hadn't forced her hand, she would never have done this. But she was a sword queen, and she couldn't idly accept what Hansen was doing. So she decided to kill him where he was, regardless of what it cost her. Isha was afraid Hansen would steal the scabbard, and that was why she had been holding off. But now that it was inside the statue, nothing would happen. If she killed Hansen, she could take the scabbard whenever she wanted. Now, without hesitation, she was happily unleashing her power. Although she could only raise the power of a Viscount, that was enough. Isha was holding her saw knife. She didn't swing it, but a purple flame was crawling atop it. Hansen was holding his steel centaur shield, ready to withstand whatever attack came next. Suddenly, a sharp pain struck his arm. His flesh was exploding. The wound on his arm was coming undone. Within a second, his entire arm was ripped open, revealing his white bones. The tear was spreading across his entire body. Hansen was shocked. If this continued, it would only take a few seconds for his entire body to be torn apart. You thought the Teet's power was that slow? That was only because it was suppressed by Demon Grave. That was why it was so weak earlier. How dare you make me mad? Today is the day you die. Isha looked cold as her purple flames increased. Hansen's wounds were being ripped up faster as a purple mist moved along his flesh and muscles. It was scary to see. F asterisk CK. That's nasty. Hansen shouted in his heart. He didn't hesitate as a red light suddenly appeared. It came right out of his jeans, wrapping up his entire body. Because the Dongshen armor had wrapped up Hansen's body, you could not tell the differences below its surfaces. But inside his armor, his body was changing. He began to look like he was made of red metal. He was becoming transparent and a powerful presence was growing within him. His super god body was activated. The tears in his arm stopped spreading, and the wounds that were covered by a purple aura were doused in white light. The purple air began to dissipate, and his wounds were starting to heal. Hansen felt as if his previously suppressed body was no longer limited. Power coursed through his body, rumbling like a river. Isha looked at the white light overwhelming Hansen's arm and felt the scary presence he exuded. Her face changed and she said, You? You've touched the deified door? Hansen did not answer. 
He pulled out a gold bow and a white bone arrow. The white light entered the arrow, activating a slumbering power. The bone arrow shivered to life, and a white light came out of it. The Archangel Bone Arrow? How? Isha was shocked. She was not shocked about the presence of the arrow itself, even though it had been made from the bones of a king feather. It had king power. Normally, an enemy of king-class power was no concern for Isha. She wagered she could block it. But inside Demon Grave, she had damaged her own body to achieve the power of a Viscount, yet the Archangel Bone Arrow had the same power that it would on the outside. It was not affected, so it was scary. Retrieving the scabbard was no longer Isha's highest priority, so she flew away from the statue and departed the lake. An Archangel Bone Arrow with full power was not something she could trifle with. Buzz. Hansen moved his finger and fired the Bone Arrow. It reached Isha's chest the instant it left the string. She couldn't evade that projectile. Isha was a deified elite. Even though her powers were suppressed, her reaction was still quite fast. She lifted the saw knife in front of her chest, and the bone arrow hit the blade. The holy light raged with the intensity of a volcano. It exploded against the knife when the arrow came into contact with it, and a catch a noise quickly followed. The saw knife that was still a bit powerful in there, made of an unknown material, suddenly broke. The bone arrow plunged into her chest and rocketed out of her back. It went through another dozen grapevines before its flight was halted. Blurk. Isha coughed up blood. A huge hole had been blown through her heart. She was not dead, though. She was still gathering up power. She ran into the grapevines and disappeared. Hansen wished to give chase, but his body was feeling weak. He exited Super God Spirit Mode, as he could only use it for a limited time. What a scary woman. She didn't die. Hansen sighed, giving up on pursuing her. Hansen turned around and looked at the forehead of the statue and the scabbard within. He grabbed the part that was sticking out slightly and tried yanking it out. When Hansen pulled on it, it refused to budge. After a few more pulls, it still didn't come free. Chapter 1800, Knife Mind Hansen pulled at it a few times, but he was unable to remove the scabbard. It surprised him. Before Hansen could make another move, he felt as if the scabbard had a beastly knife mind. It came for him like a monster, as if it wished to consume him. Hansen frowned, as his own sword mind began to battle back against the knife mind. The knife mind would not damage Hansen's body, but it was consuming Hansen's own sword mind. His will was being swallowed along with it. If his will broke, even if he was not injured, he would lose his confidence to fight against strong opponents in the future. Hansen's sword mind was rather scary, but it was shocking how much more terrifying the knife mind was. If Hansen's sword mind was likened to a strong bull, then the scabbard's knife mind was like a dragon. It did not matter how strong the bull was, it ate grass. But tigers and dragons ate bones. And right now, it was eating Hansen's sword mind. If the sword mind had a body, it would have been bleeding. Furthermore, this knife mind felt familiar to Hans Senator Isha's knife mind was very similar to it. The knife mind of the scabbard was even stronger than Isha's though. It is no wonder she came here for this. In some way, this item is connected to her, Hansen thought to himself. Isha's knife mind was so strong, he believed she must have been a king. And with the scabbard's knife mind being stronger than hers, that led to only one possibility. The creature that left behind this scabbard. Was he a deified elite? If he was, this could be one of those horrible elites that created this place. Was one of those beings a rebate? Did he leave it here? Hansen got to thinking. Still, Hansen didn't think that was quite right. If it had been left behind by one of the rebate, why would Isha wait until now to reclaim it? After all the years that had passed, why now? Hansen did not have the time to mull this over right now, though. So, he used his will to do battle with the knife mind. Even so, it was very difficult trying to battle that particular beast Hansen's will and sword mind kept getting chomped on. Han Sin's will was waning, bit by bit, and it felt as if the knife mind was gradually getting stronger. Hansen wished to leave, but his will was being subsumed, and he could not move. If he moved, the knife mind would enter him completely, ravage his mind, and utterly annihilate him. As Hansen wondered what he might be able to do to escape this, the black crystal armor inside his sea of soul suddenly moved. It generated a strange energy. When that energy entered Han Sin's body, the scabbard rattled. And then, the knife mind relented and eased up a little. The scabbard shook and vibrated in its slot, enabling Hansen to pull it out with ease. 
The black crystal armor's energy circulated all around Hansen, and then went back into his sea of soul and into the armor. Then, the black crystal armor became quiet again. It went back to being its normal self. The energy had vanished again, but the scabbard did not unleash any more of its wicked knife mind in retaliation. All it did was pulsate inside Hansen's hand. Hansen did not know why, but he felt as if he could feel exactly what the scabbard was feeling. It felt excited, surprised, and scared, all in one. Hansen was surprised, too. He did not understand the connection between the scabbard and the black crystal armor, and he could not fathom the reason why the black crystal armor could make the scabbard behave this way. Does this scabbard belong to the rebate or the crystallizers? Hansen wondered to himself, but settled on the thought that it belonged to the crystallizers more. As Hansen pondered this, the knife mind of the scabbard revealed itself again. But this time, it did not opt to consume Hansen's will. It was actually fitting itself into Hansen's will nicely. Hansen felt as if he had become an old beast and that he was eating the world around him. The universe and everything else would be wholly swallowed by him. The power to munch on the universe felt pretty good. The beastly power of consumption was inside Hansen's mind. And a second later, the beast transformed into a knife. It was one that looked familiar. The appearance looked just like Isha's knife. But the energy inside it did, admittedly, feel worse. Although the appearance was identical, comparing Isha's to Han Sin's knife was like comparing a real blade with a toy one. That knife was held by a man, but Han Sin couldn't identify the man's face. Still, he could faintly make out the shape and tell that the head had ears. But it did not matter. The man who held the sword was like a demon that was destroying the world. He slashed, breaking the galaxy as countless things were consumed. A countless number of planets were destroyed. Even space itself was slashed open. Slash after slash, that destructive knife skill was scary, but at the same time, it felt really good. Every time the figure slashed, Hansen could remember it. Hansen's mind opened, becoming familiar with the knife skill and the knife mind. Subconsciously, Hansen swung the scabbard to imitate and follow the man. Slash after slash, Hansen's knife skills were creating that same consuming power. And it was getting stronger, too. Hansen's knife mind had limits, though. No matter how smart he was, this was not something he could learn in any short amount of time. Hansen's knife mind was increasing, though. After practicing the sequence of knife skills 70 times, his knife mind was no weaker than Isha's. And furthermore, it was still growing. When it increased, the man and the knife started to get a bit blurrier. When Hansen practiced it 100 times, the man and the knife vanished. Hansen looked at the scabbard and noticed it no longer had a knife mind. The knife mind had been transferred to Han Senator. The scabbard shook and started to fly around Han Senator. It attached itself to Han Sen's waist and stopped moving. The black diamond knife's body grew dim. Now, it looked like an inkstone. 